Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. Today we'll hear from representatives of Health and Hospitals, h and &H, Voluntary Hospitals, Advocates, and other stakeholders about prenatal care in New York City hospitals. The ability to protect the health of mothers and babies and childbirth is a basic measure of a society's development. And having a healthy pregnancy is one of the best ways to promote a healthy birth. Preconception and prenatal care can prevent complications during pregnancy by helping educate pregnant people about the importance of following a healthy and safe diet, getting exercise, controlling existing medical conditions, avoiding smoking and alcohol, and ensuring they are taking safe medications. We are fortunate to live in New York City where there is a saturation of healthcare providers, where all people who are pregnant and low income can obtain health insurance, and where we have hospitals such as h, &H who provide prenatal care to individuals regardless of health insurance status and immigration status. However, our healthcare system still provides an equitable healthcare. Statistics show that while about 30 women in New York City die each year of a pregnancy-related cause, approximately 3,000 women almost die or experience morbidity during childbirth. This is simply unacceptable. Any pregnancy-related death is a tragedy. In 2016, 15 people died because of pregnancy-related reasons, and of those who died, six were African-American and six were Hispanic. In other words, women of color accounted for 80% of pregnancy-related deaths. That same year, there were 2,875 cases of severe maternal morbidity, a rate of nearly 260 per 10,000 live births. Black people were 2.5 times more likely to experience severe maternal morbidity than their white counterparts. Meanwhile, Latino people were about 1.8 times more likely to experience a near-death experience during pregnancy than white people, and Asian Pacific Islanders were nearly 1.3 times more likely. Additionally, only 23% of black patients gave birth in the safest hospitals compared 63% of white patients. Infant health is also impacted by inequities. Government data suggests that black infants are more than twice as likely to die as white infants. Research points to race rather than educational attainment or income level of the patient as the cause of such discrepancies. In fact, a black woman with an advanced degree is more likely to lose her baby than a white woman with less than an eighth grade education. Frankly, we're failing our city's infants and pregnant people. No one should fear death when bringing life into this world. What more can we do to better protect people and furthermore ensure that they are receiving safe and quality health care? Today I look forward to examining the importance of access to quality, meaningful, and early prenatal care and its impact on the health of the parent as well as the child. Is prenatal care accessible enough in our city? What are the barriers to prenatal care and how can we take those barriers down? For example, are hospitals engaging enough with the city's doula and midwife communities? What more can we do? We can no longer accept the health outcomes we have been seeing for years. Currently, approximately one out of every 23 black people who give birth will endure potential life-threatening complications. The rate for white people is about one out of every 63 births. It also bears repeating that women of color count for nearly every pregnancy-related death in the city. Today, I am asking if these statistics were reversed, if more white people were dying and nearly dying due to pregnancy, would these health outcomes be tolerated? Absolutely not. It's time for a change. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to be here today, and I look forward to your discussion and the testimonies. With that, I'm gonna call up the first panel. Deb Kaplan from DOHMH, Dr. Wilcox from Health and Hospitals, and Dr. Allen 
from New York City Health and Hospitals. you raise your right hands, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning. Chairperson Rivera, can you hear me? If we could just, yeah. Good morning. Chairperson Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I am Dr. Michelle Allen, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist by training. Substance use disorder and HIV in pregnancy has been my area of focus. I have worked in New York City Health and Hospitals for 38 years. I trained at Jacoby Hospital and have worked as an attending at both Harlem Hospital and Bellevue Hospital, and have served as the obstetric consultant for the New York City Department of Health, providing reviews of the city's pregnancy-related deaths in my past. <clears throat> I am joined by Dr. Wendy Wilcox, chairperson of OBGYN at Health and Hospitals Kings County. In addition, Dr. Wilcox is the New York City Health and Hospitals Clinical Service Line Lead for Women's Health and a Maternal Mortality Reduction Initiative, as well as the co-chair of the New York State Task Force on Maternal Mortality and Disparate Racial Outcomes. Dr. Wilcox has worked for Health and Hospitals for over 10 years. <clears throat> on behalf of Health and Hospitals Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Mitchell Katz, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you to discuss prenatal care at Health and Hospitals. As the largest public health care system in the United States, Health and Hospitals' mission is to deliver high quality health care services to all New Yorkers with compassion, dignity, respect, and without exception. We serve over 1.1 million New Yorkers every year across the five boroughs and empower them to live their healthiest lives. The Health and Hospitals system is an anchor institution for the ever-changing communities it serves, providing hospital and trauma care, neighborhood health care, skilled nursing care, and community care, including care coordination and home care. New York City Health and Hospitals has a very long history of focus on improving the health care of the women and children in this city, as our patients are often, as our patients often represent the uninsured, the underinsured, the underserved, and thus have a more urgent need for attention. For over 10 years, Bellevue Hospital has served as a New York State Department of Health Regional Perinatal Center for Health and Hospitals. As a regional perinatal center, the responsibilities include improving the quality of perinatal care provided not only at the RPC site, but at the affiliated sites through outreach services, which include 24-hour specialty and subspecialty consultation services, patient transport coordination and services, outreach and education, on-site quality of care visits at each affiliated perinatal hospital, and participation in the statewide perinatal quality improvement and activities. In 2013, we enjoined the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, known as ACOGS, Safe Motherhood Initiative, which included specific interventions for reducing the occurrence of an impact of severe hypertension, deep vein thrombosis, and maternal hemorrhage, which are among the leading causes of maternal mortality. In fact, New York City Health and Hospitals was recognized by ACOG as the only health system in New York State which had every hospital in its system participate in the Safe Motherhood Initiative. 
In 2014, New York City Health and Hospitals established the Medical Simulation Lab where we, quote, prepare for real life. We shamelessly borrowed from the airline industry to develop simulated scenarios in obstetrics and other areas so that our provider teams could practice and hone the skills necessary for those rare events in which a quick response makes the difference between life and death. We now have simulations in shoulder dystocia, in maternal hemorrhage, and cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Subsequent to implementing obstetric simulations, we have seen an improved response in these occurrences. In 2015, while some of our facilities had implemented prenatal depression screening at the time of the primary care implemented depression collaborative, the New York City Health and Hospitals as a system joined the Greater New York Hospital Association to the Depression Collaborative as part of New York City Thrive Initiative and implemented prenatal and postpartum depression screening and intervention at all of our sites. We currently screen 95.5% of all prenatal patients, 95.7% of all postpartum patients, and 91.7% of moms who are seen at the well baby visit. The yield rate during pregnancy that's a positive screen is 5.1%. And 96% of all prenatal patients with a positive screen are referred for further treatment. In 2018, in an effort to increase the clinical knowledge and judgment of our providers' teams and to engage in best practices to improve teamwork and communication and decrease variation among clinicians, as well as reducing clinical errors and reducing the number of OB adverse events, New York City Health and Hospitals invested in Reliance, which is an online educational course which provides assessment-based personalized learning. And accepted, it is accepted by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology for maintenance of certification. This is also the only online comprehensive training course endorsed for obstetrical and neonatal nurses. This is now required for attaining and maintaining privileges in our perinatal services. Improving maternal and infant health has been a central focus of the de Blasio administration and health and hospitals. In fiscal year 19, we had approximately 160,000 prenatal visits and over 15,000 babies were born in our facilities. We are committed to providing and protecting the full spectrum of women's health care. Our doors remain open to all and we will continue to support our patients in providing state-of-the-art and culturally competent care. The Health and Hospitals 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment identified reducing the burden of life cycle driven illness and health equity challenges as a priority health need. As such, we have implemented several initiatives to improve pregnancy and birth outcomes <clears throat> within health and hospitals. In 2018, in partnership with the Mayor's Office, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we began implementing a comprehensive maternal program with a focus of identifying and responding to pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality in women of color. And I'll walk you through each one of the initiatives. Number one, in our maternal medical home, care coordinators and social workers will provide care management and screening for depression screening for clinical conditions, screening for trauma and social determinants of health, and psychosocial conditions to patients who are predisposed to or high risk for poor adverse pregnancy outcomes. Our care co coordinators will help patients navigate their appointments and receive supported services. Number two, our simulation-based program currently trains doctors, nurses, and other members of the delivery team to respond to the highest risk emergency situations such as shoulder dystocia, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, maternal hemorrhage, and cardiac arrest, which may occur in the labor and birthing suites. The simulation trainings are being brought directly to the facilities as many labs are being constructed at our facilities with the most complex patients. This is just the latest contribution of the public health system to address maternal health. Number three, the Interval Pregnancy Optimization Program helps to improve maternal health by training primary care providers 
to ask patients specifically about their pregnancy intention. The question which is asked of the patients is whether or not they plan to become pregnant in the next year. If yes, she is referred for preconceptual counseling. If not, she is referred for the effective contraceptive of her choice. In this way, the health of the woman may be optimized before she becomes pregnant, her diabetes controlled, her chronic hypertension controlled, counseling about alcohol consumption and cigarette smoking. Number four, our mother-baby coordinated visit program aims to increase the maternal adherence to the postpartum visit by having the postpartum visit scheduled with and possibly co-located with the baby's pediatric visit. Number five, addressing implicit bias, which is the unconscious attitudes or stereotypes that can affect behaviors, decisions, and, ang and actions in the treatment of women of color who are pregnant is a priority of health and hospitals. H&H &H has conducted an implicit bias training for our entire board of directors and our facility CEOs with the assistance of Perceptions Institute. We have 22 additional facility-based trainings scheduled throughout the next upcoming year. In addition, in collaboration with DOHMH, we have provided training to our obstetric leaders and other trainees from across the system on implicit bias through the Rebirth Equity Alliance. These trainings were launched in October and focused on improving equity in childbirth. To date, we have trained 99 members of our staff. Number six, quality improvement. We are working hand in hand with DOHMH to provide training sessions in all of the acute care facilities within H&H, &H, as well as the voluntary not-for-profit not hospitals participating in the DOHMH Maternal Hospital Quality Improvement Network, which is a comprehensive strategy with 14 New York City maternity hospitals to address the root causes of persistent racial and ethnic disparities in maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity, with emphasis on the importance of the, quote, how-to of setting up a quality improvement process in the departments. With the DOHMH support, the eight H&H &H hospitals which are participating in the Quality Improvement Network are integrating reviews of all cases of pregnant and postpartum patients with severe hemorrhages and ICU admissions into our quality assurance and improvement processes and providing data to DOHMH to inform population-based strategies to address these conditions. The Quality Improvement Network hospitals are also partnering with DOHMH to implement the New York City Standards for Respectful Care at birth. Further training on implicit bias by Perception Institute and training and practice changes to promote respectful patient-provider interactions. Number seven, our Health and Hospitals Community Care Program ensures that pregnant women access the highest quality of care in a home setting which includes antepartum assessment and instruction, breastfeeding teaching and support, and high-risk infant care, among others. From January 2018 through December 2019, community care has provided 445 prenatal home visits, 9,700 newborn visits, and over 10,000 postpartum visits. And finally, number eight, Additionally, 10 of our acute care facilities have earned the prestigious baby-friendly designation from the World Health Organization. In collaboration with DOHMH, New York City Breastfeeding Hospital Collaborative, for promoting the highest level of care for infants through breastfeeding and promoting bonding between mother and baby. As part of New York City's Birth Equity Initiative, Health and Hospitals partnered with DOHMH and the Centering Health Institute to launch pregnant, Centering Pregnancy an evidence-based group prenatal program at New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst. Centering pregnancy has been shown to improve maternal and infant health outcomes, including reducing preterm birth, which is the leading cause of infant death, and encourages greater patient engagement during the prenatal experience. The program features group pregnancy visits with a provider, networking with other pregnant women, group discussions, and prenatal wellness and educational classes on nutrition, stress management, and breastfeeding. All pregnant women are eligible to participate in the group care sessions 
and are asked to join the group during their initial prenatal visit unless their pregnancy shows signs of becoming very high risk. The sessions begin between 16 and 20 weeks to gestation and occur with the same frequency and routine prenatal care visits. I'd like to spend a minute talking about our midwifery services and health and hospitals. Midwifery services are offered throughout health and hospitals to improve patients' experiences. New York City Health and Hospital employs over 80 midwives across the system and thus is the largest employer of midwives in New York City. Last year, Health and Hospitals North Central Bronx opened its renovated and expanded maternity unit. With an investment of $50,000, the unit's clinical space has doubled to, from 2,300 square feet to 4,800 square feet. With all clinical services available on one floor, floor, expected patients can easily access obstetric and gynecologic services and the labor and birthing suite. Patients will also be able to access the maternal fetal diagnostic unit for specialized ultrasounds. We are currently collaborating with DOHMH to assess our midwifery services to highlight what's working well and where we have opportunities to improve. And a minute on doula services at h and &H. Health and Hospital assesses doula services through our relationship with community-based organizations. Health and Hospitals refers patients who request doula services to one of several community doula providers, the Brooklyn Perinatal Network, By My Side, and Agent Song. Over the past three years, physician, midwives, and nurses have held multiple meetings with doula organizations to learn more about the services that doulas provide and to bond and form relationships with one another. Over the last three years, we have made many referrals for doula support for patients and are looking to expand these services. Both Harlem Hospital and Metropolitan Hospital are in the process of formalizing agreements with, for doula services. In conclusion, we would like to thank the Council for its support of health and hospitals in providing funding for state-of-the-art equipment to improve the care and outcomes for the women we serve, including Councilwoman Rivera and Councilmember Mark Tra Traeger. Recent fiscal year 20 appropriation of $400,000 in capital funding for upgrades to critical OBG1 ultrasound equipment at Health and Hospitals Coney Island. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and thank you for your 38 years, you said, right, of service? Thank you You're very welcome. much. I appreciate you coming in to testify today. I just have you know, quite a few questions on some of the services. Thank you for going through the initiatives. I guess I wanna ask, um, it, you have listed all the prenatal services that H&H &H provides to pregnant people. And you spoke a little bit in the beginning of if someone came in and whether they were pregnant or weren't, and you mentioned contraception very, very briefly. So I guess my question to you is, if I entered an H&H &H facility and I thought I was pregnant, what, what would happen? How would I be approached? What services and information would I be offered? Good morning. Thank you for that question. Um, so um, if you entered a health and hospitals facility for a pregnancy test, um, you would be offered a test. And depending on um, what that test showed, um, it would depend on what kind of um, counseling you wanted or, or needed. Um, certainly for someone who is pregnant and wanted to continue the pregnancy, they would be offered obstetrical care um, and prenatal care. Um, for someone who uh, had a negative test um, but uh, wanted contraception, they would be offered contraception through our either gynecologic services or family planning services that all of our facilities offer. We offer the full line of contraceptive options, including um, long, reversible, long-acting reversible contraception, so LARCs, which is IUDs and implants as well. Um, and if someone is pregnant and did not want, wish to continue the pregnancy, um, they would also be able to access abortion services at Health and Hospitals. So you would sit down, there's contraception, there's abortion care information, and if they were pregnant and wanted to continue with their pregnancy, 
you would give them information on doula services, on the midwifery programs? Does it depend on where the, the patient and the pregnant person is geographically? Does that come into account? Or do you provide the full expansive view of what you can provide to that person? So, um, you know, a lot of that comes um, in counseling a patient. So the first step uh, would be the intake and actually getting that person into care. Um, and certainly every facility has a different complement of what type of care in terms of provider is offered. Um, and um, for doula services, we do not employ doulas at any of our facilities. So we offer referrals to community-based organizations for care that would involve doula support. Um. I ask because in your testimony, you mentioned making referrals uh, for doula support for patients, especially at Kings County. Yeah. And we've been joined by my colleague, Diana Ayala, who represents uh, East Harlem, El Barrio, South Bronx. And these three, East Harlem, South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, these are some of the neighborhoods, some of the communities in our city with the highest risk when it comes to pregnant people. And so I ask in terms of some of your referral services, some of our, our networks and coalitions are doing tremendous work. They're doing very much with very little. How is the relationship between H&H &H and the community-based organizations in terms of a referral system? So Wendy will, will take that. Um, we've been working, as I said in my, test, in my testimony, with several doula groups. Um, there's a fourth one that we look at, the doula project. We're actually working very closely as it, over the past three years through can Wendy's. You, can you just over talk the into past the three years with Wendy's leadership, actually doing significant outreach to the community-based organizations um, for East Harlem and the South Bronx. Um, as I said, Harlem and Metropolitan in the process of actually uh, developing memorandums of understanding and agreement for doula services. We have a ways to go. Um, it's the patient's choice. We'd like to provide the appropriate referrals since we don't have them on our staff. I think that's in the process of changing. Do you want to add to that? No, I would just say that we're trying to encourage and encourage tight linkages um, through the departments of OBGYN in the hospitals and the community-based organizations. And we look forward to um, encouraging those relationships and actually expanding them. Is access better at some H&H &H hospitals compared to others? Yeah, I don't have in front of me the distribution, but not it's not 100% across all of the H&H &H hospitals. The majority of our hospitals do, but not 100%. Is there a wait list for some of these services at the hospitals? There is no wait list. Um, we have access for prenatal services, for virtually same-day access, definitely within the week. I ask because um, I know that some of the programs haven't necessarily been expanding, and, and, and please feel free to give me some information, especially when it comes to midwifery programs. I know some of them have, I guess, closed at certain hospitals and expanded in others. How do you make that determination in terms of the availability and access to those sorts of programs and services at each acute care? Facility. So of our 11 facilities, there are three facilities that actually don't have midwives on staff. And um, our commitment is if, they, if the need is there and the demand is there from a, from a systems perspective, we will definitely provide the opportunity and the means to recruit and hire. So is it the three facilities, is it because there is just not the same demand at the other facilities? I don't know the specifics for those three facilities. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that, Councilwoman. So you partner with CBOs to give out educational materials on all of these programs and services? Usually that's done through our health educators. Um, but yes, they're aware of the neighborhood, the, the services available in the neighborhood of the surrounding hospital. Um, and those are offered to the patients. I ask because in Elmhurst Hospital, there are 100 languages spoken in that facility alone. And I don't imagine there's materials in 100 languages, 
but I know that there are community-based organizations that can have those trusted conversations who are credible messengers. We actually, and actually in central Brooklyn, uh, we've been doing work with the community-based organizations in central Brooklyn, um, coming up with a concept piece on how to improve the health out outcomes of the residents of central Brooklyn. We worked with One Brooklyn, um, as well as the ch uh, community-based organizations with Brooklyn, and we realize that we have a lot more work to do, but we are definitely committed to engaging our community partners. Which facilities do not have midwifery programs? That would be... That's Harlem Hospital, uh, Queens Hospital, and Lincoln uh, Hospital. Lincoln. So Harlem and Lincoln Hospital, okay, and Queens. We said Lincoln. And Lincoln, yes. Harlem, Queens, and Lincoln, understood. Has, has NYC CARE had an impact on the provision of prenatal care? We, are look, we have, through NYC CARE, we've actually expanded the number of patients who are getting primary care and anticipate that those numbers will translate into our prenatal care. We are not expecting to run out of capacity. We are committed to providing the capacity as the number of participants grow. We have not heard any complaints of the problem with uh, impacting access to date. It could, it could be a positive impact. It would be wonderful. Okay, because I know you're expanding in other boroughs, and some of these boroughs, as I mentioned, have neighborhoods with, with alarming statistics and data, um, that, which is why we're here today, and I realize that Health and Hospitals opens their door to um, anyone in the city who walks in, but we want to make sure that the health care is equitable, and I think that we have found that it is unfortunate um, in terms of, as I mentioned in my opening statement, it has nothing to do with education. A lot of it is implicit bias. A lot of it is how we have cared historically for our communities of color. So what are the most important factors and risks that prenatal care addresses, and you mentioned preterm births. How do you assess uh, a pregnant person's health care risks, and how do you educate them as to maybe if they have hypertension or diabetes? So that's all part of um, the assessment um, that's done for prenatal care. Um, it uh, usually follows a standardized format where we ask about past history, not only past medical history, but past surgical history, past obstetrical history, past gynecologic history. We're also doing multiple screenings through our uh, maternal medical home project on um, many of um, social factors um, to assess for things like depression. Dr. Allen mentioned that in her opening statement. We're also starting to assess women for trauma as well. So we're really trying to do a full assessment um, and, um, and provide the care that, that every individual needs. Which conditions are associated with preterm births? Um, so the, the number one factor that would uh, predict a preterm birth is having had a prior preterm birth. I'm sorry? Having had a prior preterm birth is one of the number one predictors for having a subsequent preterm birth. And I'm going to turn to my colleagues in a second who have a question. Um, last year we had a hearing on, on screening, specifically for drugs and alcohol. Do prenatal care services at H&H screen for drugs and alcohol, and what is the process for obtaining consent? So thank you for that question. Um, it's a very important question. We had a hearing last April, um, after which we had the opportunity to work closely with ACS um, to coordinate their processes and to inform them of our processes. We have informed our CEOs, our CNOs, our CEOs, as well as our chiefs of OBGYN, that substance abuse disorder is not a moral problem. It's a medical problem. To avoid bias, 
we're implementing universal screening, verbal screening, following the protocol and recommendations of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We will be implementing a four question screening questionnaire, which will be universal. And the only reason to get a urine toxicology test is for medical conditions. If a patient self-disclosed, you really don't need to verify whether they're telling the truth or not with a urine toxicology. And any urine toxicology that will be done will only be done with informed written consent and documentation. There are, of course, exceptions to that. If a patient presents with altered mental status, is the differential diagnosis meningitis, cerebral vascular accident, or drug intoxication, that's an indication for urine toxicology. But the two main points I want to make here that we've shared with our leadership is that screening for drug and alcohol is universal to avoid the bias of screening just based on race, ethnicity, or appearance. And written informed consent, it will be required and documented in the chart. That's the expectation. Thank, thank you for that. I, I just wanna, I'm gonna go back to implicit bias in, in one second, because last April, uh, you testify that it's the policy to only drug test with the mother's informed consent, and that a mother has the right to refuse. However, you said that the testing is universal, and that it's not necessarily always obtained in writing, and in April, it was verbally between the doctor and the mother and that the patient is not provided anything in writing about the test or its potential consequences. Also, the policy is not available publicly. Has that changed since the last time you and I met here in City Hall? That has changed. I have to share with you that our legal team is reviewing all the documents. There, will be, there is a written informed consent, written information to be shared with the patient. Um, and a written and a policy. What needs to be done is education of all of our staff, making sure the documents are actually at the appropriate literacy level and translated into our most appropriate languages. There are approximately 13 languages that we translate all of our legal documents into. So currently, our legal department, our lawyers, are vetting all of that material, getting it at the appropriate literacy level, and getting it translated. That's why currently it's not publicly available. But through the clinical guidance, we've been very clear as a system what the expectations are. When will it be available? I'd have to get back to you with a date on that. I ask because, you know, our statistics showed that black and brown pregnant people are more likely to be tested. We heard some incredible stories and people who were kind enough to share their experiences. And by the way, I know we would have a lot more parents here sharing their experiences, but until we get universal child care and after school programming, unfortunately, many of them cannot join us today. So you also mentioned that since October, 99 staff members have received implicit bias training. Could you clarify how the implicit bias curriculum is developed and if the community has the opportunity to provide input? And by the community, I mean some of our local experts. And can, can you share some of these plans in writing with us in terms of what you expect to deliver in terms of training and when it'll be fully implemented? Um, so I'm not aware about sharing in writing, but I'll let you know what we as health and hospitals are doing. Um, so um, there are multi layers of what we're doing. Uh, we're partnering uh, first and foremost with New York City Department of Health um, for a few different trainings. Um, one is trauma resilience informed systems. Um, and that is looking at racism um, communication and um, making systems changes across the issue. Um, and this is involving the hospitals and the maternal hospi hospital quality improvement ne network. Um, and so to date, um, um, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has trained over 250 staff across the 14 hospitals of this 171 of the staff. Um, our health and our H&H &H staff. In addition, um, 
Health and Hospitals is engaging Perceptions Institute, which in, um, helps to engage larger groups of people um, and get them think about implicit bias and explicit bias and how it might be affecting decisions that are made in the hospital. So far we started with leadership, it started with the board and also the hospital CEOs. Um, and there are 22 um, uh, dates scheduled to go to the facilities and train more people. Um, in addition, kind of on, on top of this, um, we engaged um, an entity called Rebirth Equity um, and they actually trained 99 participants um, of multiple levels. It was mainly targeted at maternal um, and child health staff um, and um, really engaged, again, smaller groups of people to look at um, implicit bias and perceptions of others. So it's a very multi-layered approach. I saw these were launched in October. Well, I want to give my, my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions. They've been very patient. Uh, I'm going to ask first Council Member Diana Ayala. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my question is really relating to the maternal care program, and I, I wonder how much of that is guided by the patient's experience in the hospital? Are you, is that considered at all when you're training and retraining staff? Um, and I, the, the reason I asked the question is because I recently um, became, in the last few years, I've become the grandmother four times over right. and have had the pleasure of being invited to be in the room when um, my daughter had her children. So I was there for every, um, for each, each and every one of them. And I find that the experience, and this wasn't, a public, this wasn't even in a public hospital, it was actually a private hospital, was horrendous. And I hadn't realized it had I not you know, been looking from the outside in how horrible of an experience um, childbirth can, the childbirth experience can be for, for a young mother, specifically for a young mother who's very inexperienced and very, my daughter is a very nervous person as it is, so she's, I think, a little bit of a hypochondriac and she you know, calls the doctor like every three minutes, um, which I found was very uh, annoying to her, to her doctor. Um, I found that you know, she was ridiculed for her weight. Um, she was pretty much embarrassed in front of you know, her, her spouse and, and the rest of us that were uh, in the room at a very inopportune time. And I, you know, I wonder in my district, you know, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, um, you know, the numbers are astronomical. And I would imagine that that's the same for, uh, for individuals that are, are pregnant. And I wonder how much of that education really is yielded from the experiences of the patient and not so much, you know, from what we've learned in science and through books. Um, but how, how, who speaks to the patient? Um, is really important to me because I think that, you know, I, I, I just, I'll tell you that the last, the last experience that she had, she decided she, she you know, because she has hypertension, because she um, is overweight, um, that she was not going to have any more children. And um, her baby was, uh, because she, she had hypertension, had to come out immediately, emergency C-section, and her doctor um, continuous was not there. So her, the doctor that was attending continuously asked, are you sure that you want to, you know, you want to tie your tubes? Are you sure that you want to do this? You know, your baby might not make it. Who says that to a pregnant mom? Like, who says that? Like, I couldn't believe that this was said to her three times in the course of, you know, the duration of the time that she was there. Um, the baby came out purple, not breathing, and he looks at her and he says, are you sure the baby's having complications? What the hell? What is that? And I don't think that her experience was unique. I don't think that she was the exception. I think that she's the rule. And I, that, that really, really pisses me off. It pisses me off because that was not my experience and I don't understand what is happening and how much you know, education is being geared towards the doctors that are all, I mean, we, it's great to have doulas, it's great to have midwives. I had midwives for my first two children. They were great. Um, but how much education is going towards these doctors that are interacting with these patients on a daily basis? So the patient's feedback and the patient's experience and the patient's voice is very important. 
And I share with you that same experience as my daughter had her first child and my first grandchild recently. And the perspective as the grandmother, as opposed to the obstetrician, was enlightening. I'll have Wendy um, share with you perhaps another experience from another patient. But we do have patient advocates. We do have a community advisory board. And we do depend on the feedback. Our efforts, and we get, when we get that feedback, and do speak with the providers one-on-one -on -one for those providers who lack the sensitivity, lack the respect, to provide them specific training, starting with the implicit bias. Because many people don't realize how they come across, and they need to be told, and they need to be educated that what I think is inoffensive may be completely offensive. Um, I just want to say I share experience, and I, Health and Hospitals as a system is totally focused on the patient experience, and the patient should be front and center. I'm going to have Wendy speak about the things that we're actually doing to improve that. So, um, as Dr. Allen just stated, we definitely pay attention to um, our Press-Ganey scores, which gives us an indication of the patient experience in that they score us and often um, give us uh, actual quotes that are, that are shared with the department leadership that we then go ahead and give back to our patients. Um, with your liberty, I'd just like to share one um, from my own hospital that was recently shared with me. Um, when I already gave up on the natural birth to go for a C-section, the doctors encouraged me to try for the last time that I can do it, and I'm so happy that I did it and gave birth to my baby on my own without C-section. Love you, doctors. Now, that obviously is something that I will probably carry around with me for the rest of my life because it made me feel good. But as leadership, we've been working at this a long time, sharing day-to-day -day feedback with the staff, going to individual staff members, having people go to the trainings. Part of the goal of the uh, maternal medical home is to have yet another person in our practices that patients can reach out to for questions like, can I reschedule my appointment? Can I just talk to you about this? I had a question about whatever. And someone who's, they have cell phones um, and give their numbers out readily to patients so that patients have yet another person to contact. Obviously, in terms of the birth experience, um, we feel like the entire team is there to keep the patient in the center. Nurses play a role, physicians play a role, our midwives, when they are available, play a role when they're there. Doulas can even play a role in terms of keeping the patient in the center of her care and everyone engaging with her, communicating with her, you know, discussing the care plan and really trying to keep the patient center and focus. Um, you know, this is not something that necessarily is taught in medical school. Um, we're trying to change that and trying to get people further down in the pipeline um, for our learners, but it's definitely something that's front and center today, and pretty much all of the different trainings we're going through are trying to address that. How do you best reach the patient? I, I agree, um, and if there's anything that we can do, like um, Metropolitan Hospitals in my district, I'm literally uh, uh, across the street from Lincoln um, because I think that you know, more um, more education needs to occur in communities like mine, um, and educating new parents on, you know, the the, the, the detrimental effects, right, of having having not treating uh, hypertension and diabetes appropriately when one is expecting a child, and what the consequences can lead to. Um, I think are really important because I think that was always also something that because of a, a, a young parent who has hypertension, who has, you know, borderline diabetes, who would be considered, you know, to uh, be obese, not having that level of education and not understanding the correlation between, you know, infant uh, mortality and, and, you know, good health is important. So thank you so much for 
being here today, and thank you so much for um, this important subject matter. Thank you, and, and we've been joined by Council Members Levine and Moya, and Council Member Levine, you had a question? Thank you so much, Chair Rivera, for convening this hearing to focus on a really urgent challenge, and my goodness, Council Member Ayala, that was very powerful. Um, thank you for making this uh, real and emotionally impactful. Um, this is, it, we have to tackle this. We need to tackle implicit bias. We have to expand doula services. We have to confront the broader health inequities which are underlying um, the disparate outcomes in maternal mortality. We need resources to do that. And you know that Albany is facing a $6 billion budget def deficit this year, which may be balanced on the backs of low-income patients in New York State and New York City by cuts to Medicaid. And one of the things we love about health and hospitals is you disproportionately serve patients with Medicaid and uninsured as well. That means that cuts to this funding stream would also disproportionately hurt you and your patients, and I fear also um, hurt your OBGYN services at a moment when we need to be expanding resources. And I wonder if you could speak to what's on the line as we face these very frightening cuts coming from Albany. So my <clears throat> answer is brief. We have the commitment of our senior leadership that we will not cut back on any services. Our intention is to continue to provide the services that we provide today. You don't mean just for obstetrics, but for all Whether services throughout the services, system? services, pediatric services, primary care services. We are committed to the services that we provide today. You ask what's, what, what is the plan, and that's the plan that I'm aware of. If it changes, we're happy to follow up with you. I mean, that's uh, a reassuring commitment, and, and I certainly applaud you and Dr. Katz for um, doubling down on that. You could potentially face hundreds of millions in funding cuts. Just to be sober about this, it's, it's a pretty substantial piece of your budget. And I'm wondering uh, how you maintain services in the face of cuts like that. Is it closing facilities? Is it reducing headcount on the administrative side? Any cuts to Medicaid that thre threaten the financial well-being of H&H &H and our mission to quality health care will be fought. We will fight the cost cuts that threaten our health care and the safety of New Yorkers, we are prepared to work with the state on changes to their Medicaid program and reforms and savings that are critical solutions, not cuts. And I think for further detail, I would have to defer to Dr. Katz and our CFO, John Olberg, for more specifics. Understood. Um, we are going to be fighting really hard to protect you, to protect everyone in the city from these cuts with our allies in Albany. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough fight. I think the stakes are really high, especially for low-income New Yorkers who rely on Medicaid to stay healthy. If, if I may, just very quickly, I know that you talked about NYC care and the rollout in the Bronx. Uh, I think it's true that uh, to tackle disparities in maternal mortality, we also have to tackle disparities in broader health care, including primary care. Um, and NYC care is a really important component of that strategy. Uh, you're now fully rolled, rolled out in the Bronx, correct? Sure. Uh, Brooklyn is next. Uh, what's the timeline going forward? I don't have the timeline <clears throat> with me right now. Um, happy to get back to you on that with a specific timeline. Council. Okay. Council Look, I, I think to state the obvious, if uh, an individual who doesn't have insurance has the benefit of an annual physical and getting their vaccinations and 
catching medical problems early so that, that preventative action can be taken for conditions like, like hypertension or diabetes. Um, when you can have that baseline of primary care at the moment in which someone becomes pregnant, they're just going to face much better odds. And uh, so NYC care is actually, in my opinion, also a critical component to uh, reducing disparities uh, in maternal mortality and improving neonatal outcomes. Agree with you 100%. We've been working closely with our primary care partners, recognizing that improving the baseline health of the woman makes all the difference in the world with her pregnancy experience. So we've implemented the pregnancy intention question within the primary care visit so that every woman of reproductive age is, has a conversation, are you planning to become pregnant within the next year? If she indeed is, then she's sent to OBGYN for preconceptual counseling. And in the meantime, the primary care physician, because our guidelines and our thresholds during pregnancy are much tighter than when you're not pregnant. So there are different targets for blood pressure and sugar. In addition to that, if the woman states that she's not be desirous of a pregnancy in that year, we actually refer her to GYN so she can have the appropriate contraception of her choice. And realizing how important primary care is, the postpartum visit is really important as well. At the postpartum visit, you get to have your blood pressure rechecked. If you've had gestational diabetes or further complications, medical complications of the pregnancy, that postpartum visit is where you get to see if they've resolved or not, and if they've not been resolved. And even if they have been, if there's an underlying condition, that's the opportunity to refer the patient back to primary care. We realize about 40% of our pregnant women do not keep their postpartum visit, whereas 98% of them keep their well baby visit. So we're working with our facilities so that the postpartum care is co-scheduled and maximally co-located with the well baby visit. Now, some of our facilities have been able to co-schedule, but because of space constraints, not co-locate. Co Others have been. We've been using Saturday hours and nighttime hours, evening hours, realizing that many of our moms work and can't come to the hospital between 9 and 5, may not have the ability to take a day off, sick leave, et cetera. So we're working very closely with our pediatric partners to ensure that our patients Okay. get their, their postpartum care completed and if they need and refer them back to primary care because you're absolutely 100% correct. The primary care, our primary care partners are the ones who engage us in preventive health care, work with our weight, work with our nutrition, work with our exercise, education. I just can't agree with you more. Okay. Well, um, we appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Allen and Dr. Wilcox. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for mentioning the, the co-scheduling. What about the emphasis on, on a, a, f a family medicine doctor and perhaps having those visits happen at the same time to increase the percentages so the doctor can check out the baby and they can check out and talk to the parent? So, I, so it was 40% for the postpartum visit. They don't for, keep their visit with the obstetrician, but they'll bring their child to the pediatrician. So when they come to the pediatrician, we're actually doing the postpartum visit at the same time in the same place. I just think, I, it, you know, in terms of our time and our resources, we just want to make sure, because I know the family medicine practice is, is so, so important, and we're all very fearful uh, of the cuts, but just know that we will be there fighting for you. And I, and I will be asking Greater New York as well, because they do a lot of lobbying in Albany, and that's going to be incredibly important. So just a few more questions, because we have a lot of people here to testify, and I want to make sure that we can keep them in here with us. So in terms of maternal morbidity, there's DOHMH support. There are eight H and H hospitals integrating reviews of all cases that include severe maternal morbidity. What are you doing with the review of these cases and the data that is informing what you called in your testimony population-based strategies to address these conditions? So the hospitals and the MHQIN are submitting their data to the Department of Health, um, and. Um, they, in turn, can give us our own data back to us. Um, however, before that, as Dr. Allen mentioned in her testimony, we have a regional perinatal center at Bellevue, so we were collecting 
a lot of the same data um, and using it um, as we as we plan our care. When I asked about uh, preterm births, and you mentioned one of the highest kind of indicators was having a previous uh, preterm birth, but what are the other indicators and conditions? And is there something structural about these conditions? For example, if it's diabetes or it's hypertension, are we looking at maybe that pregnant person lives in a community without access to healthy food, for example? So that is um, what one of the main reasons why we implemented the maternal medical home. Um, so in addition to the routine uh, screenings and history that we would take during the clinical exam, that we would be able to um, screen patients for some of the social determinants of health, um, as well as I mentioned, you know, depression and trauma and things like that. Um, to figure out who our most high-risk patients are, and then with the help of a maternal care coordinator and or social worker, um, the patient is guided to um, additional support, however that support is needed. What are the actual conditions, though? Can you give me a few examples? Sure. You mentioned some of them yourself. Hypertension is very um, prominent in our communities, um, even higher than some of the New York City averages. Diabetes is also high. Um, patients uh, who've had a prior preterm birth. Um, obesity is also an independent risk factor for some adverse pregnancy outcomes. So all of those things um, would uh, qualify a patient as uh, being at higher risk. And in I pregnancy. would just add structural anomalies as well. Fibroid uterus is a, um, notable for causing preterm labor. There's a broad spectrum of etiologies. And just to clarify, do all of the H and H facilities have prenatal programs available? Yes. And would you be able to share the budget for these programs by facility? Unfortunately, I don't have those numbers, but we can follow up with uh, finance people. That that would be that would be great. I just want to make sure that we have these numbers on hand so we can have a finance hearing that really gets to to the heart of of what we can do to best help your facilities. And I guess uh, I'll ask just a couple more questions and then we'll move on to our lovely panelists. So how are you ensuring that all pregnant people receive proper and meaningful postpartum services? I know you mentioned the co-scheduling and what you're doing to keep the mother take, or the pregnant person taking care of themselves. Do you partner with Thrive at all? Say that again. Thrive, Thrive NYC. Yes, we do. In terms of services, just yes. trying to get an idea. That's one of the functions of the maternal care coordinators and the maternal care social workers in the maternal medical home is to um, help to uh, ensure that women are also reminded and coming back for their postpartum visits. In addition, Health and Hospitals Community Care provides care in the community, um, nursing care and um, care through our community liaison workers. Um, and that can uh, certainly be for patients who are discharged with hypertension and or other medical conditions. Um, there are also referrals for the babies. And just to give you a few numbers, Health and Hospitals Community Care over uh, the course of two years, so from January 2018 to December 2019, uh, provided um, 445 antepartum visits. Um, 9,704 newborn visits and 10,122 visits in the postpartum period. Thank you for those numbers. Um, we're going to hear from a number of people that provide services um, pre-birth and throughout and I hope that you'll stay and listen to their testimony, some of their stories and their experiences and I just want to thank the both of you for giving us so much time today, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. We're going to call up uh, Cynthia Lynch. 
from the New York Association of Licensed Midwives. Shawnee B. Gibson, spirit of a woman. Melissa Gradilla. And Patricia Lofman. And just to make sure that we get to all the panelists here um, and that we hear from our, from Greater New York, I'm just gonna, we're gonna put a clock on the timing and we're gonna put a clock for two minutes if that's okay. <clears throat> Good morning, thank you for having this meeting today. My name is Cynthia Lynch, I'm a licensed midwife. I've been in New practicing in New York City um, and primarily in the H&H &H system for the last 20 years. I'm here today representing the, as the Vice President of New York Midwives, which is the New York State affiliate of the American College of Nurse Midwives, which is the professional organization that represents licensed midwives nationally. I just wanted to let you all know that midwives are independent providers. We attend approximately 10% of all deliveries in New York State. We are masters or doctorate educated and obtain licensure in New York after passing a national credentialing exam. Um, the midwife model of care promotes pregnancy as a normal physiologic event in a woman's life and prioritizes a woman's psychological, physical, and cultural needs. Um, I want to thank the council for taking the time to discuss midwifery care and its role in serving the women of New York City. Um, some of you may or may not know, but uh, 2020 has been declared the year of the midwife by the World Health Organization because of our role in protecting and promoting maternal health world, world, worldwide. Um, and sake of, for time, because I know you've talked a lot about statistics, um, I'm going to sort of skip through that. Um, and jump to the, uh, Governor Cuomo's task force on maternal mortality and morbidity, which showed some really stark racial disparities in maternal care and outcome. Um, black women in New York are eight times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women are. Uh, severe maternal mortality is estimated to result in additional costs exceeding $17 million each year for New York City alone. One of the driving forces behind maternal mortality and morbid morbidity is a uh, cesarean section um, and the complications that come from that. According to the DOH statistics, as of 2016, am I over my two minutes? No. You can, you can okay. finish your thought, um, of course. New York State had a cesarean rate of 33.9%, and when broken down by race, black women were six times more likely to die of complications from cesarean section than white women. When the midwifery model of care is integrated into medical establishment, it has been shown to improve maternal outcomes. It is the standard of care in many European countries, such as England, France, and Sweden, which all of which have better mortality rates than we do here in the US. Um, a review of, a Cochrane review of literature shows that midwife-led care decreases preterm birth, use, decreases the use of pain medication and cesarean, and cesarean section, um, and can help to reduce maternal, New York's maternal mortality rates. In addition, midwives promote maternal autonomy, share decision making, provide maternal respect, and are crusaders for reproductive justice. We invest time and resources into our healthcare relationships and we increase client satisfaction. Midwifery care improves maternal outcomes and lowers costs by avoiding the overuse of interventions and eliminates unnecessary and non-beneficial interventions, including primary C-sections, uh, avoids short-term and long-term complications and chronic conditions for women and newborns that can sometimes result. 
Um, and it also, by definition, if you, just wrap, if you could just wrap up. Okay, repeats the cesarean sections. So what I wanted to really say is that, in short, midwives have been working in New York City for a very long time. We have been in a couple of the different H and H city hospital systems since the 70s. We have really great stats. You won't hear about them. Our services are underutilized. Um, Woodhull is one shining star of the system. Their primary section rate is 13 point, is 12.6, and their repeat is 13.9. Um, the European model exists at Woodhull, where midwives are fully integrated into low risk and high risk care, um, and. I think there needs to be some something spoken about sort of the power dynamics that occur within the HHC and in general in hospitals where midwives don't have the same ability to be heard, seen, paid, hired. And while H&H &H has midwives in several hospitals, they're not all utilized to the same extent, which is why you don't see the same stats in the different hospitals. And midwifery care is a solution to this maternal crisis that we have, and we just have to start utilizing it. Like, it exists and we're doing it. We just need to use more of it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, good morning to the, to the council members. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony before the hospitals committee. My name is Patricia Loftman. I'm a certified nurse midwife, fellow of the American College of Nurse Midwives, and former Harlem Hospital Center Director of Midwifery. I graduated from Columbia University Graduate School of Nursing with a specialty in midwifery in 1981. I've been a midwife for 38 years. I practiced full scope midwifery caring for women for three decades and was the Harlem Hospital Center Midwifery Director from 1984 to 1999. I retired from clinical midwifery in 2010. A midwife is a licensed independent healthcare provider with prescriptive authority in all 50 states. While all midwives possess a master's degree, many possess a doctorate as well. Midwives practice full scope midwifery, which provide the full range of women's reproductive health care through the lifespan. Midwifery care encompasses prenatal, labor and delivery, postpartum, gynecologic care, which includes contraceptive management, and postmenopausal care and primary care. I would like to provide a historical context of midwives in Health and Hospitals Corporation, now known as H&H. The Harlem Hospital Midwifery Service was the second oldest midwifery service in HHC, second only to the midwifery service at Kings County Hospital. The Harlem Hospital Midwifery Service was created as a clinical site for the Columbia University uh, midwifery students in 1965. Columbia uh, University midwifery students were not permitted to use the Presbyterian Hospital as a clinical site, as it was reserved as the domain for the Columbia University School of Medicine medical students. I entered Harlem Hospital in April of 1982. I wanted women to understand that receiving health care in a public hospital did not mean having to accept second class care. I became midwifery service director in 1984. Shortly afterwards, I joined the HAC Council of Midwifery Service Directors. The council was composed of HHC midwifery service directors. All HHC hospitals had a midwifery service. Between 1985 and 1999, when the council was dissolved, HHC midwives attended the births of 25% of all HHC hospital births. Midwives were a critical and integral part of all obstetrical departments. I was a midwife at Harlem Hospital when the community was ravaged with the crack and HIV epidemics beginning in 1984. For 10 years between 1985 to 1995, I, together with another midwife, cared for women whose pregnancies were complicated by drug use and or HIV in infection in a special prenatal clinic designed specifically for them. These women should not have had a good outcome 
but they did, and why was that? These women attended clinic weekly, which was a requirement, and adhered to multiple and varied appointments. They were engaged in their health and health care because they were cared for by midwives who looked like them, who understood their cultural and linguistic norms, values, and needs, and who did not practice medical apartheid, which had been their experience, and who used medical technology wisely, and with whom they developed a relationship based on trust. The women remained engaged in the healthcare system post-delivery, continuing to adhere to health maintenance activities. While the women had the option to return to the regular GYN clinic, they chose to continue to receive their reproductive care in the special prenatal clinic. Recently, an unprecedented amount of media attention has centered around the crises of black maternal morbidity and mortality. Today, black women are eight times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than a white woman in New York City. Evidence has emerged to support racism as a direct cause of the medical conditions borne by black women that place them at risk for maternal morbidity and mortality. Ms. Midwives Ms. provide women-centered, individualized, respectful, safe, and satisfying maternal, maternal care. While emerging evidence reveals and documents that health systems that integrate midwives experience less cesarean section, premature births, and neonatal mortality, the number of H&H hospitals that don't have a midwifery service has never been higher. My own hospital, Harlem Hospital Center, eliminated the second oldest midwifery service in New York that not only provided the template on how to care for pregnant drug-using women, drug-using and HIV-infected women, it was the first baby-friendly HAC hospital in New York City. I was instrumental in both. Midwives also provide primary care and empower women to maximize their health and emotional well-being once the maternity cycle has ended. Women enter their subsequent pregnancy healthy, thereby improving their pregnancy outcomes and preventing pregnancy-related death, near deaths and deaths. More and more women of color who are the consumers of women's reproductive health care in public hospital systems where most midwives work are asking for midwifery care and midwives who look like them. At a time when access to abortion services is under threat, midwives were included in the New York State Reproductive Health Act, which codified Roe protections into New York State law. In closing, substantial evidence exists that documents the benefits to all women of midwifery care. Midwives are experts in holistic health care and vast, and vast experience across all birth settings from home, from home birth and birth center to large tertiary academic medical centers. They increase health equity to women and families, enabling them to address issues of reproductive justice, birth equity, health disparity, maternal and infant morbidity and mortality, and primary care at a time when the availability of women's reproductive health care providers is decreasing. All women deserve a midwife. The only way that will occur, however, will be if every H and H hospital has a midwifery service that is fully integrated into the H and H hospital system. Thank you so much. Hello? All right. Thank you to the New York City Council Committee on Hospitals for organizing this hearing on the importance of prenatal care, disparities, and midwifery and doula care. Uh, my name is Melissa Gradilla, and I'm with Every Mother Counts, a nonprofit organization in New York City um, whose mission is to make pregnancy and childbirth safe for every mother everywhere. We work towards achieving quality, respectful, and equitable maternity care for all and we prioritize working with community partner organizations and bringing their voices to the forefront. 
Delivering high value care requires that we place women and families at the center of the experience while seeking out innovative and evidence-based strategies such as midwife-led clinical care and perinatal doula support which confer important benefits to women, families, stakeholders, communities, and insurers. We urge the New York City Committee on Hospitals to scale up and further integrate these proven high value models um, into the health system. As we've already heard, uh, reliable and consistent evidence shows that both midwifery and doula care reduce cesarean and preterm births, increase breastfeeding, improve care satisfaction and engagement, prioritize shared decision making, and they are cost effective. These solutions are documented to be effective in low and underserved populations, but remain unavailable to many in the city based on where, where they live or their income. Expanding access to midwives and community-based doulas would help enhance available support services, address racial bias, and fill gaps in our mater maternity care system. Midwives have served as an essential part of the city's maternity care workforce, but midwife positions have been cut back and birth centers at Bellevue, Morris Heights, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai West have been shuttered. In New York City and state, efforts to increase access to doulas are underway, but small scale initiatives and limited implementation has meant that only a small percentage of communities in need are being reached. We urge the, com the Committee on Hospitals to learn more about the work of community-based organizations such as Ancient Song Doula Services to explore ways in which additional collaboration and integration can be accomplished. Um, I'm gonna wrap up because I know my time's uh, up. Uh, but in closing, improving maternity care is just, it's about more than just improving the clinical care. It's also about improving women's experiences. A recent study called the Giving Voice to Mother study uh, recently revealed that one in three women of color giving birth in the U.S. hospital reported mistreatment, including being shouted at, scolded or ignored, or having their request for help being refused or delayed. We need to ensure that people are engaged in care decisions and that their care reflects their right to be treated with respect and dignity. This goes beyond eliminating bias, racism, and disrespectful treatment. It requires valuing women's right to make informed decisions about their own care, the right to be listened to, the right to be heard, the right to have their needs met from the beginning. Thank you. And thank you for all of your recommendations, which are in line with many of the panelists before you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shawnee Benton Gibson. Let me begin by thanking and acknowledging the City Council for having this convening and creating a forum where these issues can be presented, discussed, and explored. I appreciate you, each of you who are sitting here still, for your efforts and your time and attention. I sit before you today as a community member, a healer, an advocate, an activist, a clinician, a spiritual leader, a disruptor, and a mother of three. I'm also unapologetically black, a cisgendered woman, African-American, a New Yorker, and a queen from Queens. And finally, I am your neighbor. I'm a fellow citizen and mother in mourning over the loss of my eldest child whose death could have been prevented. Today, I act as a vessel and a conduit for the voice of my daughter, Shamani Makiba Gibson, and the voices of so many young women of color just like her. They are no longer here to physically speak for themselves. However, their spirits are ever present and alive as I address this community of leaders, innovators, and witnesses who are gathered here today. My daughter's story is loud, colorful, expansive, and artful. It is filled with the energy that she possessed when she was living, breathing, and moving through this world. Her story is in the hearts of those who knew her and in the mouths of those who knew her as well. It is also in the air and the ethers now that she has transitioned. Shimani's transition was sudden and unexpected. However, as I look back over my work as a reproductive advocate and leader in the reproductive health community, I have to question why I thought that I would be spared. I question why I was not expecting Shimani to succumb to the issue that so many black and brown women throughout this country, in this city, and throughout the world have. I never thought about her being in danger of losing her life as a result of her bringing her children into the world. I was actually more concerned about her having postpartum depression or psychoses, which is something that runs in our family. 
I forgot about my own birth traumas and those of my mother, grandmothers, aunties, and sisters. I forgot about it because I thought that we were smart enough, educated enough, and connected enough to prevent that from happening to her. I naively believed that my optimism about how knowledgeable we all were would shield her from this epidemic. Wow. Shimani's death continues to reverberate across the city and nation because she doesn't fit the formula. And yes, there is a formula. When I read the articles, reports, and the research regarding maternal morbidity and mortality, I see information that speaks to physical health challenges and dis-ease in the body. I read about women who don't have access or who don't have adequate medical care. I read about women and families who don't know their rights. Shimani's experience did not align with that formula. She was vocal loud, commanding and demanding. She had a degree in business and two active and lucrative businesses. She was a community leader, a performance artist and a visual artist. She was trained and developed as an adolescent to speak up and serve our community in order to com combat racism and white supremacy. She had a midwife, midwives for both her pregnancies and her births. She had doulas, for both her births. She did research so that she could re breastfeed properly, nourish her babies. She danced while she was pregnant, walked, studied, talked about it, bragged about it, and intuited about it. She was awake, aware, and active about black maternal health and the darker side of reproductive health. She was proactive and productive regarding her health and the health of her family and her friends. She wanted to know. She was a seeker, and yet she still died. So clearly knowing is not enough. Having resources is not enough. I am here to say that everyone that is present for this conversation isn't necessarily fully invested in doing all that it takes to stop this epidemic. Just because you are sitting at the table doesn't mean that you are invested, fully present, or equipped to address what is being presented here. And just because you are not in the room doesn't mean that you aren't committed, interested, and equipped to provide guidance toward effective, generative, and equitable solutions for the greater good of all. Yesterday was MLK Day, and what I got profoundly connected to as I contemplated that his life, what his life and legacy means for all of us, I got c connected to the fact that um, your sense of purpose can sometimes be ignited by the darkest, most tragic, and mentally, spiritually, physically, and emotionally devastating things. Martin's legacy was fertilized by the scourge of racism, white supremacy, and hate. His purpose was inextricably tied to saving the saying the unpopular, doing the unthinkable, and going toward the unimaginable. I'm here because I'm willing to go to the deepest, darkest places and spaces so that no more women have to die and no more children have to grow up without their mothers. They say that if you know better, you do better. I don't agree. Knowing is not enough. To do better is to do better. Wombs create worlds, and as such, the women who house them must be treated like the world. This country has taught black women to remain silent, keep working, multitask, even when the baby, you have a baby in tow, to figure it out on their own despite the odds, to ignore their mental, spiritual, and emotional pain, and when all and when we do all that, we are still judged for everything that these oppressive and racist systems have forced upon us. There is an informal saying in my work as a clinician. The saying declares that if it's hysterical, it's historical. Our bodies are processing trauma daily as black women. It's compounded trauma. It's the trauma of our mothers, 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 and it's killing us. There was never a time for a black woman to address their traumas, especially when we were released from enslavement, especially those that are associated with the foremothers and forefathers who went through enslavement or enslavement-like experiences. And those unaddressed and unspoken traumas live in our bodies and they breed dis-ease. Stress and trauma are silent killers, and if they are mobile, and, and it, and also they are mobile, transferable, and contagious. We have been taught that trauma is vicarious, but trauma is contagious. It spreads, it compounds, it binds, and it alters. It impacts the body on a cellular level, and it can open you up and shut you down. Every case where a black or brown woman who dies or has a near-death experience will not have a smoking gun or a direct line to negligence connected to it. However, we as leaders, politicians, clinicians, medical practitioners, 
we have been willfully and woefully negligent by not doing the work to address how racism, oppression, and white supremacy has diminished the quality of life and quality of health care in our communities across this nation and the planet. This morning, I'm not requesting a universal protocol for all women. Universal means one way of doing it. A universal protocol that applies to all women will not say black and brown women. This morning, I'm asking for a set of specific protocols, actions, policies, and procedures that are uniquely tied to the women and babies who are black and brown. It is our sisters who are dying or having near-death experiences while doing the most natural thing that a woman can do, which is to bring life into the world. Today, I'm asking for a comprehensive solution that addresses the needs of black and brown women across their lifespans. What I am seeking are systems, protocols, programs, and people who will speak to the reproductive needs and wants of black and brown girls and women. Education that is specific to the skin that you are in. Systems and institutions that are committed to making sure that we address racism and anti-black racism specifically. Formal and informal leaders across all disciplines that are committed to principles over power and politics. Screenings pre, during, and post-birth. Physical and mental health screenings, and including the extended support persons that know what's going on with the woman, that which she talks about and that which she does not. Bundles to address medical crises such as hemorrhage, blood clots, high blood pressure that are applied universally for black and brown women. Full spectrum doulas on deck for all women of color. Compensation that aligns with the rich, generous, and multifaceted services that they provide. Community midwives of color in recruitment, scholarships, and other financial support to ensure that those who wish to pursue this age-old vocation can actually actualize that vision and purpose. And I thank you for this black midwife, because black midwives are like unicorns in this world. Community health workers, wraparound services, anti-black racist training that speaks directly to white supremacy as a construct, not necessarily a person, a face, or a position. Education that begins in medical school, that is injected throughout a medical provider's career. Mandatory continuing education, especially around anti-black racist work. I am here to declare that my work will not stop. I am here to hold myself accountable and to hold those responsible who knowingly and unknowingly keep this epidemic going. I am here to let you know that Shamani Makiba Gibson lived. She is alive in this work. She is alive on the, in the faces and the DNA of her children, the two, my grandchildren that are still alive, Anari and Kari. She is alive in this movement and she is alive in this moment as I speak her name. Shamani Makiba Gibson. Shamani Makiba Makiba Gibson, Shamani Makiba Gibson, thank you for listening. I just want to thank you. Thank you for everything for all that you have said, not, not just the midwife, if I could just call you, you're, you're a pioneer in this, in this field and what we're doing. And uh, to know that we're closing these services instead of expanding them, the reason I just shut off the clock was we've already lost so much time. I share. So I just want to thank you all for sharing and, and taking all your recommendations very, very seriously. I wouldn't be having this hearing if you didn't have my full commitment that this is what we deserve. We deserve more services, we deserve an expansion, and we deserve to remove the barriers in becoming a midwife, in continuing to serve this city. And um, I, I just wanna thank you all so, so much. Thank you. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna call the next panel, Lorraine Ryan, Dr. Tara Shirazian, and Helena Grant.
we want to? Okay, we being sworn? One? No, okay. <laughs> Um, Chair Rivera and members of the Hospitals Committee, um, my name is Lorraine Ryan. I represent the Greater New York Hospital Association and all of the hospitals in New York City and beyond that are part of the association. Um, I first want to acknowledge the prior panel and uh, with all due respect, I appreciated all of the comments that they, that they made today. Um, I thank you for holding this hearing and for allowing uh, Greater New York to speak on behalf of the prenatal care postpartum care and perinatal care that is provided in our hospitals each and every day. Um, as a clinician myself, I've been actively involved in improvement efforts with our hospitals for more than two decades. I think with such limited time, I want to acknowledge um, that healthcare, we be all believe, uh, Greater New York strongly supported the ACA, that healthcare is a human right, and our con institutions, which are nonprofits and public hospitals, continue to care for the most vulnerable patients in our communities. Um, we view addressing racial disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity as part of that mission. However, there are many hospital challenges that we currently face. <clears throat> as you know, we're fighting uh, major budget cuts to the Medicaid program um, and beyond at both the federal and state level. Despite that, our hospitals proudly provide maternity services um, throughout the city and beyond. In 2018, they delivered 103,000 babies, 57% were Medicaid, 40% private insurance, 2% uninsured. However, despite these unprecedented threats to the survival of New York hospitals, our hospitals continue to keep their doors open each and every day, 365 days a year, and committed to providing the best care possible notwithstanding insurance status. With regard to prenatal care, I will go very quickly. I think it's fairly well understood. Prenatal care is provided by our hospitals primarily in clinics and in private practices. If a mother suffers complications during the pregnancy, she may be admitted to the hospital um, and cared for by specialists at that point in time. Um, the goal of prenatal care is to keep the patient um, and, and the baby in the womb, the fetus, healthy, to monitor progress and to intervene as necessary. Uh, monitoring weight, diet, exercise, mental status, um, and, and conducting ultrasounds and sonograms to ensure the growth and development of the fetus is normal and routine. More and more of our hospitals are supporting, however, those non-clinical services, such as centering pregnancy for expectant mothers, which combines individual prenatal physician visits with peer group support to um, discuss uh, and understand what it takes to go through a healthy pregnancy, to deliver an infant, and to take care of that newborn within the context of the family. Centering pregnancy programs have been associated with reduced incidence of preterm birth, uh, percentage of low birth, birth weight infants, and lower incidence of gestational diabetes and postnatal depression. Currently, the Department of Health is supporting two pilot programs around the state. Um, the first cohort is underway and New York City, Suffolk County, Rockland, and Westchester downstate are part of those pilots. Uh, these are covered services, and when they're not covered, they are being provided by the institution. They're run by certified midwives um, who lead um, the group under the supervision of an obstetrician. We also wholeheartedly support doulas and midwives. Uh, midwives um, are present in many of our hospitals, as you've heard today, um, but not all of our hospitals. And we would love to see more of that uh, taking place throughout the city. Greater New York supported legislation at the state level to allow midwives to run their own midwifery birth centers, and hopefully that legislation will push more and more of those centers to open up. Despite all these efforts, however, there are stark racial disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity that you've heard about many times today, so I will not go through it again. How are we responding to the problem? The 2018 task force at the state level on maternal mortality and disparate racial outcomes was created by the governor, and out of that task force came 10 specific recommendations. I will touch on a couple of them. Along with the recommendations came $8 million in support. Are you telling me I can have a little bit more time? Yes, I'm going to give you a little more time, but we did not set the clock. Oh, good. Um, okay, so. good for me. Okay. Um, we talked briefly about the maternal mortality review boards that exist both at the both at the state and city level. Um, these are designed to examine cases to understand what the opportunities for improvement are so that we can avoid future mortalities and morbidity. These are subject matter experts in obstetrics as well as the improvement science that will unearth these root causes to prevent recurrence in the future. These are essential at both the state and city level. 
Last summer, and I think one of the most effective things that we've seen in the last couple of years um, in New York State in terms of uh, addressing the maternal mortality and morbidity crisis are the listening sessions conducted by the State Commissioner of Health um, along with um, representatives from the communities throughout the state. They were held in Brooklyn, Harlem, Queens, the Bronx, and across upstate. This, these sessions were intended to visit high-risk areas and listen to local concerns. What came out of those sessions were the ident identifying the need for more minority healthcare professionals, midwives, doulas, practicing obstetricians, and non-licensed clinicians. Increased awareness of disparities among providers, implicit bias training, you've heard it mentioned many times today, our providers need help and support to deliver equitable, culturally competent medical care. We all have to acknowledge that. Increasing provider support during the postpartum period. The, the first meeting of the state's postpartum work group just met very recently, and they have two and three pages of recommendations for what we need to do in the postpartum period, which is commonly now call, called the fourth trimester. I agree wholeheartedly with the fact stated earlier that 40% of women do not even make that first postpartum visit because of the challenges of taking care of their families. <clears throat> Thank you. Currently ongoing, if I could just very quickly wrap up. Up. Just there wrap up. I just want to make number sure of quality something. improvement pro programs that were mentioned earlier by Dr. Allen, the maternal depression screening program that took place in New York City, the focus on the, the uh, safe motherhood initiative bundles on venous thromboembolism, hemorrhage, and hypertension are very actively um, engaging our providers, collecting data, but more importantly, implementing evidence-based practices. Uh, we can I'm going to ask more. you a question about some of the, okay. the things you've recommended. Okay. I just want to make sure that... Okay. Just last final comment. Um, while hospitals absolutely have a duty to do better and strive for optimal outcomes of care, they can ultimately only control what happens within their clinics and the four walls of their hospitals. We need more support in the community. We need community-based resources at a level that's meaningful, not just something that we're throwing you know, pennies at it, if you will. We need to address food and housing insecurity, inaccessible primary care, lack of access to education, poor transportation, one of the reasons mothers don't get to those postpartum visits, language barriers, health literacy, lack of emotional support, and many others. Um, with that, I will happily answer questions um, and leave you with our mantra that social justice should be our guiding principle. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can go. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Tara Shirazian. I'm an OBGYN here in New York, and I'm the founder and president of Saving Mothers. I started Saving Mothers a decade ago. It's a New York City-based organization. Our goal is to decrease preventable causes of death around the globe for women and improve access to health services. We create models of care for women that combine health education, hospital-based access, and also community-based um, sentiments and understanding in order to optimize care for women. So we're in many countries globally, and this year we set out to create a New York City initiative after learning so much about issues related to maternal mortality, disparity in, in health, racial disparities, all the things we've already spoken about today. So the way in which we started this program was actually looking at the data that exists, that's published data on maternal death over the last two decades. We did a thorough search of all the programs in New York State and what they've accomplished in the last two decades. And unfortunately, we've learned that they have accomplished very little in terms of changing the maternal mortality rate. But many of the programs, and of the 16 pro published programs that we identified, 15 were hospital-based and one was community-based. So the community-based programs didn't have a lot of published data out there to really look at and evidence to sort of demonstrate its full impact. And to be clear, we were looking at maternal deaths specifically, so we were not looking at like neonatal death or morbidity or preterm pre labor, any of those things. Maternal death was our, one of our key words. So we learned that of the programs that exist, both the hospitals and the community have great elements, um, but there is no one solution. So we set out to kind of create a combined effort uh, between sort of the hospital and the community, if you will. We call it the Empower program. We just launched it in Harlem um, last month, and it's a program that's geared towards the mothers themselves and the community health workers in Harlem that are currently taking care of them. 
So the program consists of education, and I mean specifically health education, but practical health education that involves understanding your health risks and understanding your complications in pregnancy. We know what women die of. They die of PE, they die of preeclampsia, high blood pressure, cardiomyopathy. We know the causes. So educating around the symptoms and the causes is really our goal. So we set out to launch the program. We've just sort of started. We've had a lot of great feedback from the community. And our goal is to expand this program but offer health education both for those community health workers and other community participants. We are very open to partnership and we hope that many groups will want to partner. And we are giving these kits to the, to the women themselves and teaching them how to use it. So there will be kits that involve understanding your health risks, improving communication, improving you know, how you're heard in the hospital. Um, and so that's where we started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Greetings, I'm um, council members. Um, I'm Helena Grant. I'm actually the director of the district. Do you uh, just want to make sure your mic is on? Is it a red light? OK. Um, greetings, council members. My name is Helena Grant. I am the director of Midwifery. At Woodhall Health and Hospitals, I'm current New York City representative for the New York State um, Association of Licensed Midwives. I'm the current co-chair of the New York City Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee. I'm a member of the Co College of Nurse Midwives, and I'm also co-author of the midwifery statement for the New York City Doula Report by the City Council. Um, and I want to just thank you for this invitation. Um, I want to start off by stating that offering midwifery care to all women within a hospital space is not only safe, but satisfying and sacred. I think we're hearing a lot about the safety measures, but we're not hearing a lot about um, satisfaction, and we're not hearing about calling in the sacred, and that's really, really important to women's satisfaction. And when we change language around what we do, we change outcomes. I want to talk a little bit about what happens at Woodhall and how we create the statistics that we're really proud of. So many patients who come to Woodhall are low risk and are cared for completely by midwives, and they will actually never see a doctor. However, the hallmark of our obstetric service at Woodhall is an integrative team approach that emphasizes co-management with midwife, a midwife and physician team. And if the patient develops risk factors but is very attached to the midwife, we provide them with a return to normal philosophy for the labor and birth. So even if the cl client has mild to moderate complications during their prenatal course that transfer necessitates them to go to an MD during their care or very high risk care with the maternal fetal medicine doctor, the midwife will c get back in on the woman's care and will be with her during her birth. And Woodhall mirrors this European obstetric model that has been talked about a lot during today. Um, using this model has garnered us some really tremendous results. Um, year after year, midwives attend the labors and catch the babies. Again, labor language matters, so we don't deliver babies. That's something that comes to your house. Um, with the close work of our physician team, um, we yield a very whole, low primary C-section rate of 12.6%, repeat C-section rate of 3.93%, uh, episiotomy rate 1.4%, third and fourth degree laceration rate of 0.1%, our VBAC after cesarean rate, 67%, and these rates have been noted at exemplary around the nation. I mean, these are the rates that women are talking about, um, and these are the rates that lower maternal mortality um, and morbidity. Um, it's one thing to tout your horn and say what you're doing. We do refer many of our clients to um, doula services, most notably Ancient Song and Doula by My Side. Um, and we do, at Woodhall, have a very high rate of home birth and birth transfer site where we welcome doulas. Um, and I'm just going to read a testimony with permission from a doula who had to transfer a patient because it's, again, one thing to talk about what you're doing, but to have outside people talk about it is always um, more proof positive. Um, this is by doula Ever Erica Livingston, who says, my client was originally expecting a home birth, but ended up with preeclampsia at 37 weeks, and hence needed an induction that took three whole days. The midwifery care at Woodhall is impeccable. Everyone, including the doctors and nurses, clearly worked 
or consensually. This is not the way it is in most hospitals at all. The client had a really positive experience and absolutely loved her birth. As a doula, I can say I have not transferred to any other hospital in the city that had the pleasure of coming upon so many people who were genuinely kind. My client felt like her choices were grounded, centered, and honored. No one checked her without asking first, and even when they were examining her, they asked her if their touch was okay. As a doula, I have emoji heart eyes over Woodhall. It was so good that when it was time to leave, I had a hard time leaving. I live in Bushwick, and I had two home births myself, and this was the place I was going to come if I had to transfer. The midwives and doctors seemed to have a woven basket within their care, and clearly there was no competition. The work integrated with one another, and there is no birth hierarchy. Everyone from the nurses and the midwives and the doctors were circled around the client and centered on serving her. I've wondered if part of this was because there were so many women of color working together as well. As a doula, I felt integrated into the space and was respected for my role. It was easy to support my client at Woodhall and the team made me feel valuable. It's such a safe place for clients and doulas, and my client is still on fire about the care she received, and I would be honored again to doula in the space. And I just want to say this is because outside of all of the programs that you heard, we are having some really integrative conversations um, within our obstetric team about books like Medical Apartheid, about books like killing the black body, and about what it means to really treat women from an epigenetic um, perspective, because we do realize that both in midwifery and medical education, those things were not taught. And so people of color need to be at the forefront of this movement, teaching other people who want to care for the women and families in these communities. And so these things need to be integrated because medical care sits outside of those other teachings. Thank you so much. And I, I did visit Woodhull Hospital to see um, th this area of the hospital, and, it, and it's, it's beautiful, and I think there's just an energy there it's that energy. really speaks to how you're trying to approach this in a holistic way. And I know that this is the European model, so what are some of the, the key elements of the European model that have led to some of the successful outcomes that you mentioned? Well, the European model is very similar to what I described. Midwives are the hallmark of care across Europe. It's only because of the United States history of both racism, patriarchy, and putting women of color out of business that we we have um, obstetricians who basically own obstetrics. Um, Europeans have a shared model and philosophy of care um, where even when the woman is moderate to high risk, unless she She's extremely high risk, she's cared for by a doctor. But if she's low risk, like we know um, in England, the, the queens of England, they all had their babies with midwives. This is a United States phenomenon um, that we have medical, patriarchal, technocratic, meaning that we use technology to monitor to women in labor. And it's really about the history and knowing the history of women being removed um, as midwives from taking care of their own community and bringing other persons who are not from their community in to take care of them that don't speak the language. And language could mean like when I say to a patient, um, you know, I need you to eat some vegetables. Auntie needs you to eat some vegetables. That's very different than a, a physician who's 25, who's just saying, Miss, you have this high blood pressure and I need you. It's, it's a different way. As you said, you use the word energy. It's a different energy and it's a different connection that we share with the clients. And even midwives who a lot of times are not from the community, they learn some of that over the course because of the midwifery philosophy. So it's the philosophy of care that makes the difference in the space because even when the woman becomes high risk, there is a different level of education and synergizing of thought and being one with the woman that can happen. Thank you so much for that because I, you know, I, my jurisdiction here as the chair of the Committee on Hospitals to, is to discuss prenatal care in our hospitals, but our whole intention is about birth justice. And, you know, I, I, I joked with, with um, my team and, and the amazing staff here that, you know, the hashtag of this hearing was going to be called the midwife. But, you know, these are serious, serious issues. When we have 10% of our births in the presence of a midwife, but almost everywhere else in, in, a, in a modern society, it's, it's well over 
We are just dragging our feet on one of the most serious issues of our time. So I just want to thank you for what you are trying to do, and I know that um, you know it's, it's, it starts it starts at home, right? That's how we organize. That's how we get things done. And and I want to I want to ask a, a couple more questions. Um, let me start with Greater New York because you, you did have a, a, a number of information that you some information that you gave us and I wanted to ask because you mentioned community-based resources and I think everybody here is in agreement that we want more community-based resources and for um, our colleagues at Saving Mothers you mentioned that uh, you only had a little bit of data from community-based uh, organizations. That was published data evidence, which is really what I look at to determine, you know, how to construct a new program. Like, what, what are the models that work? And actually, I should say, there are lots of models across the country that work. California has a, it's all in this paper, which I'll leave you, but California has a few very effective models that combine a lot of community organizations and hospital-based organizations. So there are methods that will move us forward, but it requires a lot of collaboration. Well, we have something, we have DISRIP, and the, the question is whether or not DISRIP is actually working, and, and I wanted to ask that we all agree that we need more community-based resources. In fact, a lot of our community-based organizations, they're doing a tremendous amount of work without receiving the funding at all or on time. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal of DISRIP, you know, where money flows from the state to the hospitals and then to the community-based organizations that the hospitals are partnering with. So how has DISRIP improved the resources in communities regarding prenatal care? We've heard it isn't enough. I think we need a DISRIP focus on prenatal care. The next generation of DISRIP, which is currently uh, in the works of working it through the federal and state system to be approved, will have a very specific perinatal focus. Governor Cuomo has already stated that. And um, hospitals cannot provide, and the clinicians that you've heard from today, I think would agree, you can't provide the type of care that you need that is so holistic and comprehensive to a mother and baby without engaging the community. And the safety net that communities used to provide immigrant communities, and to some extent, and I can obviously not an expert, even the, the uh, African American communities are no longer there. The toxic stress that you spoke of earlier is engaging uh, and distracting people from away, away from being that provider or that support. And that's where centering pregnancy, doulas, and, and other neighborhood initiatives um, are becoming the village, if you will. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity with DISRIP and to, with this, as I said, there's already um, a targeted focus on maternity care. They haven't called it prenatal care, postpartum care, but we're looking at the comprehensive journey that a woman takes um, during, and really we need to start before pregnancy. The Department of Health is also focused on maternal wellness, preconception care. Does a woman even understand her underlying comorbidities prior to becoming pregnant and getting those under control so that the pregnancy has a chance of being a healthy pregnancy? So I, I think this, this hearing is, is very well uh, positioned to really have an impact on where the DISRIP targets um, are in the future of that funding, which is yet to be determined. But I, I hope so. I mean, uh, many of us are worried. Is, is that we hear a lot about listening sessions and <laughs> boards and task forces. And, and I'm always led to, to the same question, which is what are we doing with the data? How are we actually translating that? Into, into work when we know what has been working for decades and centuries, actually centuries. <laughs> yeah. I, I think those listening sessions are a bit of a game changer. There's no turning back. There's no putting the words that came out of those sessions back in the bottle. It was stated women don't feel respected the way they need to be respected. They don't feel that they get the tailored care that we've all heard today is so important and vital to certain types, to all communities actually. Um, so I, I think the genie's out of the bottle on this one, and we absolutely support greater funding, um, whether it's through a district-like program or directly to CBOs who are, are aligned, aligned with inpatient providers and clinics. Whatever the recipe is, we are supportive of more. I, I understand about the funding. I just want us to just always remember there are always going to be challenges in funding for, mm -hmm. for our city to, to be threatened. Um, with eliminating what is probably the most basic human right, which is health care, is, is to me uh, inducing a level of anxiety and stress that our community-based organizations and our public hospitals have already had to deal with for a Brandon. very, very long time. 
So I hope we can all work together on this one. I just want to thank you all for your testimony, for the work that you're doing, um, and really appreciate all, all, all your work and your recommendations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mimi Niles, Deborah Lesson, Denise Bolds, and Chanel Portia Albert. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced anyone's name. Please feel free to correct me. Should I start? Hi, uh, good afternoon, I should say now. I started with good morning. Um, I'm so grateful that the Committee on Hospital had the vision to have this committee hearing. As is obvious, this is a topic that many of us are really passionate about. We probably could have used the bigger room. Um, my name is Dr. Mimi Niles. I'm a midwife and a midwife care researcher. I did all my training here in New York. I am an immigrant to New York. My mother was a midwife in India before we immigrated to New York, and I've been working at Woodhull for the past 10 years as a midwife clinician. Um, I just wanted to, I think everything that I have written has already been shared, so I think I'm gonna just focus on one part of my testimony, which has been shared, but I do wanna highlight. It's essential that we understand that just including midwives does not do enough to change the systems of care and the institutions of care. So it's not enough to have maybe one midwife or two midwives as some of the H&H &H facilities do. Really the change happens when there's full on integration of midwifery care into services. So services like Jacoby, Woodhull, and NCB, which were the focus of my research, have fully integrated midwifery care into all aspects of their women's health care trajectory for people. And that's really when you see improvements of care. So I see in the briefing that was created by, I'm not sure who, you mentioned the midwifery integration scoring system. And we know that when there's higher integrative scores, that overall healthcare systems do better. So though New York is in the higher quartile, we only scored 54 out of 100. That's not great, that's not a passing score. So we can still do much, much better on how we're integrated. The H&H &H facilities integrate midwives, but not consistently and not across the board. So you can go, you could take a 30 minute subway ride and have a very different maternity care experience in an H&H &H facility. So I really wanna make it clear to the council that it's not enough just to say that you offer midwifery care, really it's the quality and the full on integration of midwifery care that really matters. And it matters to women, it matters to family, and it matters to providers as well. My research shows that when midwives are allowed to fully function to their full capacity, to the full scope of their practice, they are also more satisfied in the care they give. And that increased satisfaction leads to increased engagement, it leads to increased, um, commitment to the communities that they're working in. So it really is this very positive feedback loop of, it's not just about what the providers are able to offer, but how do we make relationships of care that are beneficial to everyone? Because providers are burnt out, something we don't talk about enough. Providers are fatigued and burnt out, particularly in the public health care system where we are under-resourced, we are understaffed, and we are doing the work that many of the private hospitals have chosen not to take on. So we really, the public system bears the burden of the people that the private hospitals do not and will not care for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good day, City Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Deborah Lassane and I am the Director of Programs at the Caribbean Women's Health Association. Um, I'm gonna kind of go off my written word because so much of it has already been said, but I just want to say first of all that Caribbean Women's Health Association provides a range of services to support um, pregnant women and postpartum women 
throughout New York City. We do receive funding for a doula initiative called Healthy Women, Healthy Futures. And um, the city council funding allows us to coordinate the provision of doula services. Um, it is a citywide initiative, but Caribbean Women is responsible for coordination of doula services in Manhattan, Bronx, and Queens. So a lot has been said today on the importance of doula support, and I just want to say that Caribbean Women has been a part of this effort. Um, this is our sixth year of providing doula services in New York City. Caribbean Women's Associ Health Association was established 37 years ago to provide maternal and child health support services because immigrant women in East Flatbush, predominantly from the Caribbean, were not receiving adequate prenatal and postpartum health care support. So the pregnancy and birth outcomes for this population was very poor. Over the years, the Caribbean Women's Health Association programs have expanded to meet the needs of the community. At this time, CWHA still has a particular focus on meeting the needs of pregnant and postpartum women, and we also provide HIV testing and prevention education and immigration legal services. Although maternal and child health outcomes have improved overall in New York City in the last 37 years, there are still glaring maternal and child health disparities across the neighborhoods and communities of New York City. I live and work in East Flatbush, where 37 years later, we are still working to improve maternal and child health outcomes for mothers and babies in New York City. Um, I'm just going to skip to the part of my testimony where I highlight the fact that severe maternal morbidity and severe and um, maternal mortality are very high in the community of East Flatbush where our organization provides services. Um, and I've outlined the data. Um, the severe maternal morbidity rates are measured per 10,000 deliveries. Immigrant women are particularly at risk for severe maternal morbidity. For 2013 and 14, the severe maternal morbidity rates for East Flatbush was 567.7 cases per 10,000 deliveries compared to a rate of 270 for New York City overall. Mm -hmm. That's more than twice the rates for East Flatbush. Also for East Flatbush, the rates of expected mothers receiving late or prenatal care is higher than the citywide rate. In addition, one in eight births to East Flatbush residents is preterm, which is higher than the citywide rate. In addition, East Flatbush still has consistently high rates of infant mortality and neonatal mortality between um, 2013 and 2017. There are many factors that contribute to these striking disparities, including preconception health status, poverty, racism, and overall access to adequate health care. However, the social determinants of health also play a major role in women's overall physical and emotional health, including housing, access to food, etc. CWHA provides breastfeeding workshops, parenting classes, and other supportive services to more than 300 pregnant women per year. Most of these women are referred to CWHA from local hospital prenatal care clinics. And I just want to highlight that we do have a very good working relationship with Kings County Hospital, which is located blocks away from our um, facility. Um, so we do receive many referrals for social services from Kings County. In light of the maternal health issues that continue to exist in our communities, our hospitals need adequate and secure staffing and funding to be able to provide a high level of care and service coordination to all, regardless of insurance or immigration status. This is especially important for pregnant and postpartum women who should be receiving care in a comfortable, culturally sensitive, and stress-free environment. Our overall recommendation is to improve the effectiveness of, of hospital prenatal care services would be to identify resources for improved coordination between hospital-based services and community-based supportive services for pregnant women, especially for communities like East Flatbush and Brooklyn, where the health status indicators for pregnant women are still unacceptably high. We are also recommending increased resources for the most high-need areas in New York City, for evidence-based evidence interventions that will improve the quality of prenatal care services for high-risk women, such as perinatal case management services, 
comprehensive doula support programs, and centering pregnancy programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mella. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Denise Bolds, and I am known here as Bold Doula. I have my own private practice as a doula, and I'm just honored to be sitting at the table with these wonderful women who have also contributed to my practice. I have so far in five years supported 144 births uh, in my private practice. I have a master's degree as a medical social worker, and before that, I was working as case management for high-risk pregnancies for managed care organizations. So I'm very much in tune with that. I also trained at Bellevue Hospital back in the 80s as a trauma technologist. Uh, I wanna pull you back even further. 55 years ago in 1964, I was born at Harlem Hospital. My mother gave birth to me by herself unassisted in the bed where she pushed me out and unwrapped the cord from around my neck and actually put me up to her chest because she had tuberculosis and the nurses did not want to assist this pregnant woman in delivering her baby. Our system here has been flawed for a long time. It is, this is not a recent thing, this is not new news. This has been happening for a long time and as gentrified as Harlem is today, Harlem Hospital is still one of the most underserved, underpaid, under-resourced hospitals in New York, and that in itself is an atrocity. Um, I'm working and volunteering at Harlem Hospital with their new upcoming doula program. Why should I have to volunteer? My lights are not free. My education and a master's degree was over $100,000. I'm still paying that off. But yet still, community doulas are asked to work for pittance. They are given the lowest of education, and they are asked to come out and do the resources on their own, and they're also asked to work close to free. That is an equity that is not fair. Here in New York, we also have a situation where a lot of our moms are giving birth with doctors who are students themselves. And that culture, that energy has to stop. It is a lack of congruence, it's a lack of respect, it's a lack of diversity. I also want to mention that Erica Garner also died from postpartum complications of pregnancy. This was one of the strongest voices in New York, and when it came time for her to have that support and help postpartum, she didn't have it. Think about that. Um, I also want to mention to you really quickly before uh, uh, my time is up too, is that historically ACOG has always not been supporting of blacks since the emancipation with slavery. And blacks had to go out and forage and get their own medical doctors and their own medical system of care. We cannot keep building on expectations of having a better medical system prenatally and postpartum on a system that was based on racism. We have to address the foundation if we want to address the house staying up. I'm very, very passionate and compassionate about what's happening here. And as a mentor of doulas, I mentor doulas here in New York. And the doulas who are coming through are on front line and they're dealing with a lot of oppression and hostility from hospitals. And hospitals don't understand. Every time a doula walks into their doors, there is customer satisfaction that improves their NCQI scores in order for them to keep their accreditations. We have to work hand in hand in order to understand that. I have a podcast of 10 years with over 100,000 listens, and I've given voice to the voiceless by letting those people, the birth workers of color, have a platform to speak and share their information. I'm a little dismayed that with all the work that I'm doing, this past panel that was up before me, the woman who was talking about her Hall Embrace program, I've never heard of it. Why am I not hearing about these type of resources? Because we're still in silos. We have to think about this and we have to take a very close critical look and we have to have the right people, all people who are frontline doing the work at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel Porsche Albert. I am the founder and president of Ancient Song Dual Services. I am also a commissioner on the NYC's Commission for Gender Equity. Um, I thank you for hearing my testimony this morning. So I'm going to make mine very short and sweet because I'm actually coming from a 45-hour birth. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> birth is long sometimes. Um, and doulas um, work hours that um, go above and beyond the extension of um, your physical and mental capacity to be able to provide equitable services to individuals throughout um, NYC and, and in this country. Um, I want to touch upon some of the things that were mentioned earlier in regards to Asian H hospital systems and their implementation of doula services, as well as their lack of a um, lack of providing resources to midwifery care to individuals within their catchment areas. Um, I've noticed that implicit bias has become a catchphrase uh, for, um, or, or a comfortable language for individuals to make them feel good about not necessarily addressing the real problem within systems, which is racism. Um, what we actually need within um, our hospital care systems is one, an overhaul of systemic change that addresses an anti, and, and that encompasses an anti-racist medical model of care that actually sees the individual as a whole person and understands that a one-off training, a bundle, and um, a couple of, uh, of seminars and task force is not going to do the job in providing equitable services to individuals. I also want to mention, although I am a doula, I don't think that is the burden of the doula to carry a heavy load of trying to end racial disparities on their own. Doulas are overworked, overtaxed, and completely overpaid. Oh, excuse me, underpaid, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> underpaid in the meant. services that they, they provide. As a community-based organization that serves all of NYC and parts of northern New Jersey, um, we have been around since 2008, and we actually started in my living room. Started with having conversations with individuals and really wanting to connect, connect on a real human level to be able to provide services. Since the uh, the um, media attention around the infant and maternal mortality, because the infant and maternal mortality rates have been atrocious for years, but since the the media attention, we have tripled the number of referrals that we get on a monthly basis. Hundreds of referrals from institutions and hospital-based institutions and other community-based organizations. We have 70 doulas who volunteer their time, who are, un who are underpaid or are doing it at no pay. We are a small community-based organization that is providing services to individuals in which we have a, a model that says we don't turn anyone away. How are we supposed to be able to provide culturally relevant, culturally humble care that centers the individual in an equitable way when we ourselves can't take care of ourselves and the families that we have in a way that feels good and equitable to everyone throughout NYC? We need to move away from cultural competency in a more culturally humble framework that understands that I don't understand, and it's a learning model. A true collaborative care framework that encompasses the midwife, the OB, the nurse, and the doula that is truly informed, that's trauma-informed and patient-centered, that really centers the needs of the individual on a case-by-case -case basis and not on a uh, um, throughout the spectrum of their reproductive health course. Um, and I just, I, I'm gonna keep it very short and sweet and just um, leave it, leave with a quote from Martin Luther King, um, because I, I believe he's a radical visionary and, and sometimes people like to dilute that vision. But it says, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute mis misunderstanding from people of ill will. And so understanding that good intentions without backing means nothing. It is our human right and our human and our moral right to stand up for human rights and justice when we see something that is going on. And when we continue to allow individuals to be treated in a way that disenfranchises them, either through economic injustice, climate injustice, or inter personal interaction within the healthcare system, we continue to morally degrade ourselves as human beings and as those who need to hold each other accountable for the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and, and thank you for mentioning um, well, we've talked a lot about the history today and how deeply racist and, and entrenched it is and even how to this day we hold in high esteem medical professionals who engaged in the sterilization of black women, of Puerto Rican com 
the Puerto Rican community. Exactly. And it's hard for us to now be think that we're going to trust the very people that try to uh, take away what is something beautiful, um, something that should be cared for. So I just want to ask uh, a question, and then I want to turn over to my colleague here who joined us um, who joined us today. So there are discussions at the state level to incorporate doula services into Medicaid. <laughs> For some reason, this is controversial. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we'll tell you why. Help me. What are, for me, I, I mean, I think I know how we all feel about this legislation, but I'd love to, to hear briefly how one or all of you feel. And I think the barriers that, that people face in just trying to, the barriers to practicing as a doula, and also the most significant barriers to, to accessing doula services. I guess those are my questions for you. So in regards to the New York State Doula Pilot Program, I can say that currently as it stands, it's inequitable. Um, it's inequitable for the reimbursement rate that they are providing towards doulas. I mean, I just said I came off of a 45-hour birth. Um, having someone who is supporting you for 45 hours, who is not really eating, who is not really sleeping, who is being attentive to the individual, who is providing comprehensive care to support someone through their birthing experience and then only being reimbursed for um, services at a $600 rate in New York City is not a living wage. The average individual or doula, realistically wise, in a place where they don't, you know, overexert themselves, can maybe have about three births a month, right? At the reimburse and understanding how Medicaid reimbursed, we also understand that Medicaid may or may not choose to bill or to reimburse that doula at, at a in a timely manner as well, right? Um, the individual then um, is also uh, burdened with the fact that they now have to look towards billing. Um, something that they may not have done before. This is another expense that is now taken out of the doula's own personal resources. On top of if they have children, they have to pay for childcare, on top of transportation, on top of all of the things that they need just for a daily living, right? Um, doulas, it also puts a burden on the individual who receives Medicaid in being able to access a doula who is, who has culturally relevant care and has that understanding of that background. Um, the ways in which it is set up, um, a doula can come and just say, I'm a doula and provide services and not necessarily understanding where did this person get training? Has this, has this individual been trained to be able to serve communities of color, black and brown people? Have they been um, trained in trauma-informed care um, to be able to provide services? The other bill that was recently vetoed which was the uh, New York City, which we, a lot of people here sitting at this table, fought against, um, was the doula certification bill, which would put, have put limitations on the doula being able to practice in a free will, right? As we understand, doula service is a holistic service, much like acupuncture, right, or acupressure, or somebody going to get a Reiki session, or a massage therapist, right? Um, the, the doula thereby would have been under the constraints of um, institutions and not be able to practice independently and freely as they would want to, to be able to sustain themselves at, at, a, at a living rate. And so the, the current legislation that has been brought forth has been something that has been inequitable, um, not only to the individual doula, but also to organization. As, a organi as someone who runs a doula organization, the burden of having me now having to charge individual doulas in order to get uh, reimbursement for the services that were rendered is an additional burden on the individual which should not be had. Um, having doula services from community-based organizations that are provided for where there is funding for being able to administrative services to, so that the, the burden is not on the doula to have to have that is something that needs to be put in place and more equitable services. So, and let me just, because I want to make sure that uh, Council Member Rosenthal, who joined us, has a question. I want to make sure she gets a chance to ask it. So what, what's a better way to increase the access to doula services? Well, first of all, the Medicaid doula uh, pilot project that here, that's here in New York State, to me it's a punitive response to if we have doulas come through, then this will increase and, and, and rectify our statistics, right? And it became a very punitive setup 
and, and what Chanel just said. I don't need to reiterate all of that. It is not equitable. It is not helpful. It is not pertaining to access. Medicaid is not the solution to doula access. It is a three-legged stool. Hospitals need to have a leg on that stool. Insurance companies need to have a leg on that stool, as well as the state. And if you have a budget line for a hospital, put, put $100,000 on their budget for a doula program, even more than that, but just as a pilot, you will see their NCQI scores are going up. Insurance companies, I, I did medical case management, bet days for high-risk pregnancies it cost more money. It bleeds out more money of the system. If you put in that preventative budget for a doula, you're going to save money on bed days. But meanwhile, hospitals and insurance companies have been basically excused from contributing to this resource. And that's where there's a fallacy with that. So it's a punitive response to the call for having a doula, but it is not the solution because Medicaid alone is not enough. Insurance companies have to be on the, on the, on the line as well as the hospital. Thank you, thank you. I, I like to add also that Medicaid reimbursement for doula services is only addressing part of the problem when it comes to maternal mortality and morbidity. We heard earlier that um, it's not just low income women that are impacted by this issue. Mm -hmm. It's black and brown women who are being more impacted regardless of their income status or the education status. So just to focus on Medicaid reimbursement for doula services is not, you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's not really addressing the whole issue. I also like to speak to the funding of doula services here in New York City, set aside from the Medicaid issue. We, as I mentioned, we are funded by our community-based doula program is funded by the New York City Council. Because of the New York City contracting process, um, it does not allow us to fully operate our services year round. Um, from year to year, our contract with New York City is usually completed. The contract process is usually completed in May of a fiscal year that begins in July. So community-based organizations are expected to operate at, um, uh, provide staff time and other resources. And, um, with regards to our doula program, oftentimes our doulas have to work throughout the year without being paid because our New York City contract has not been completed and finalized. So that is really something that needs to be addressed in order to improve um, support services for pregnant women in New York City, specifically doula program services. As well as um, HAC and their implementation of their doula services, um, the implementation, although they are working with doulas, having, just having doulas sitting at the table and hearing their voices and not necessarily taking their voices into consideration um, doesn't mean anything. Um, also, having a doula program and not putting aside funding to be able to support said doulas, providing their time and their energy and their resources to patients is inequitable. You can't say that you want to have a doula program within your systems and then not provide a way for doulas to, um, to support themselves and being able to do the work and serve the community in a way that not only serves community in an equitable way, but also serves the individual so that they feel valued within the work that they do on a consistent basis. Doulas give up hundreds and thousands of hours a, a month in services, and most times for free, especially if it's a community-based doula. And that's not an equitable model. It's not a sustainable model, and it's not a way for, for um, doulas to be able to continue to do this work in a way that feels good to them and serve the communities that they live in. Can I add, too, that Medicaid is also an issue for midwives, so we are not equi equitably reimbursed either. Yeah. I can do a birth in room six, and a physician can do a birth in room seven, they will get 100% Medicaid reimbursement. I will get 85% reimbursement mm -hmm. for better quality care, for more time, for more engagement, for more trust building, for more family involvement. So this, this is an example to me of structural racism and medical patriarchy. Mm -hmm. it, because if those are the decision makers here and in Albany, and if those, all those health decision makers are physicians, this is the problem, right, is how do we dismantle historic power systems because they infiltrate every single part 
of the system. And I, I stand here with my, my doula comrades in, in saying that this, this impacts all of us and that trickles down into the people we are really here for, which are the, with, which are the women, the childbearing people, the families, the communities that are the bedrock of New York City. Yeah, so, and I just want to add to for doula care, doula care, 45 hours at a birth, that, that's about right. Don't, also, don't forget, we are on, all, we're on call starting at about 36 weeks, okay? I have to be by the phone, I have to be ready to go. I also have to provide two prenatal visits and any other crisis intervention and resource linkages that may come up until the birth. After the birth, I have to do breastfeeding support, postpartum visits to the home, as well as the continuation of that resource linkages and providing support and services to make sure that that baby can stay alive to the first year. Imagine that. That's what a doula does. It's not just the birth itself. We are encompassing a lot more and delivering a lot more care. And we are also asked now to do crisis intervention, social work. We're, we're asked to do a lot more out of our scope of practice. And that wears a doula thin. I'm one of the fortunate doulas. I'm walking in with the master's degree in social work. But not all of my doula sisters have that same level and scope of practice like I do. So we have to keep in mind what we're asking for and what we're reimbursing doulas is completely inequitable. And, th and thank you for mentioning, I know that earlier I, I said on how if you're paid, you're paid late, it, it's just unsustainable. And especially if you're a small organization, which I know many of you are doing a lot with so little. So I just want to thank you. I want to recognize Council Member Matthew Eugene who's joined us and I want to ask uh, Council Member Rosenthal had a question. Who's yeah. joining us? Thank you so much. And thank you, Chair Rivera, for holding this incredibly important hearing. Um, and thank you to everyone who's come to testify today. Your work is so critical. Uh, I'm wondering when a, a couple of things. One, when you sat and heard the H and H testify, and D O H M H testify, um, did you feel that they, and given the fact that we've now in terms of my personal involvement, have been actively engaged in this for a couple of years as I've been chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, pushing for more money in the budget for maternal care, uh, doula services. Do you feel over the last two years that their level of engagement, <laughs> <laughs> their level of engagement, their commitment, their comprehension as we've uh, codified the M3RC, including doulas, midwives, that their commitment has improved? No. Or changed? No. I think that their hand has, and I'm gonna be very transparent, I think that their hand has been forced to address the situation that they are ill-equipped um, and resistant to doing in an equitable way. I think that community-based doula organizations and individuals who are advocates within this work, whether it be around reproductive justice or birth justice, their work has been co-opted and manipulated into systemic, not even systemic change, but silo change mm. within um, particular areas um, that is um, inequitable and does not, um, they don't understand what it means to be not just in a community, but an extension of that community. And the community-based doula organizations and the midwives who are working within these particular areas are not just working in the community, they are extensions of those communities in which they serve. And so the Having personally sat at these tables and understanding yes. what these individual, what these things are doing, there is a, there's a, a great resistance to systemic change. There is a great resistance to accountability measures that would truly center the patient in a way that uplifts them and makes them feel empowered enough to be even to say, oh, this is what I want or this is what I 
don't want. Using ACS as an agent towards manipulation, fear-based coercion to get someone to comply with a medical um, procedure, mm -hmm. getting, um, using, using um, manipulative task um, of, of, uh, I'm sorry, my level of frustration is just... Um, really high, rightfully high. It's, it's very high, and I'm also coming off of a birth. I appreciate <laughs> you. Yeah, 46 hours. But, but, yeah. but understanding that, the, that these individuals work in these systems on a day-to-day -day basis and are doing it highly frustrated, but are still showing up at work every single day and giving their all. Yep. Midwives are trying to provide care in a way that centers, truly centers the patient, and they are being restricted, not by um, their patients, by institutional policies that will not allow them to practice in a way that, that is functional. So let me ask you specifically, mm -hmm. is it the way doctors are trained and doctors have so much power in the institution? Or is it that health and hospitals corporation and trickling down to each individual hospital, the presidents of the hospital are not messaging? Right, so that is a part of the problem. A part of the problem, yes, is education. But overall, it's just, there needs to be systemic change, right? Because you can't, you can't write up a, a respectful care at birth documentation and hand it to a patient and tell a patient, oh, these are your rights. And then the patient goes into a center and says, yeah, you know, this is what it says. It says that I have these rights. And then the provider's like, that's cute, but that doesn't mean anything to me. And is that resources? Yeah, that's resources. Those, those are resources that we all, we, that we what worked on. What I mean is, is, does the doctor say, great, doesn't mean anything to me because I don't have the resources? No, it's not because do they don't that. have the resources, it's because they don't have the training and the knowledge to be able to facilitate okay. that. All right. And then, Can some, I add something please. as well, as speaking as a midwife who works in the H&H &H system? I've been in the system for 10 years. Um, and I think, I don't think my answer is as absolute as no. And it's what I appreciate about doulas is that they are external to the system, and so they can, their ability to hold the system accountable is different than for those of us who are in the system, right? So we are seeing the system from a different perspective. I will say that I've definitely seen the rhetoric around maternity care quality change in the H&H &H system. What I have seen slow to change is embracing the midwifery model of care. I will say also in full sort of transparency, I have been hired as a consultant by Health and Hospitals to do a broad overview of what midwifery care looks like in the H&H &H system because they realize that if they're gonna make a full transformative, responsive plan to address maternal morbidity and mortality, they're gonna have to utilize a model that has been underutilized in the system. But in and, places and where it works, it works well. At Woodhull, it works well. At Jacoby, it works well. At NCB, it works well. So I also encourage people to look at what is working in that system so that we can replicate it. And I do think that medical patriarchy is a very real, Mm -hmm. Absolute, as absolute as this table, it's not just conceptual. It exists not just in H&H. &H. We also have to hold the private hospital's feet to the fire. What are they doing for, what are they doing for our communities? Because the people they don't take care of are, get absorbed into the H&H &H system. And at Woodhull Hospital, has maternal mortality decreased? I don't know the statistic on I that. I know I can speak personally as someone who had a home birth and had to transfer to Woodhall Hospital and who have worked with the midwives at Woodhall Hospital that they offer excellent and professional and culturally relevant and culturally humble care. Now I will say that the, 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 the places that um, Dr. Mimi um, Niles has mentioned are places where there are individuals who are striving to make a cultural change within the environments that they are in. And they are working really hard to ensure that those things, and they have worked really, really hard to ensure that those changes are being met and that they're being followed through. And not, uh, not easily either. They've, their 
are met with resistance on a consistent basis, but yet they still continue to fight for those changes. And if we do follow the models that these individuals um, have, have implemented within these particular places, I think that more individuals will be able to access services in a holistic way. Can I, can I just, um, in response to your question, this morning we heard from health and hospitals, we heard testimony from Dr. Michelle Allen and Dr. Wendy Wilcox. We did not hear testimony from New York City Department of Health and, and um, Mental Hygiene, which I was very surprised because this is an effort, we are all involved in this effort, and the effort, the effort should include input from the, the hospitals, the Department of Health, which is very vested in, in this work, and community-based organizations. So I think, it, 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 as far as I'm concerned, we should have heard from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene this morning. We, community-based organizations, we work very closely with them, and the hospitals work very closely with them to improve maternal health outcomes. So they definitely should have been a part of this conversation. I also want to say that in terms, as we all have to work together, that the health and hospitals facilities are all at varying levels of community involvement mm -hmm. when it comes to prenatal care and working with pregnant and postpartum women. Yes, we, we my organization, we have excellent working relationships with Kings County. Um, I, I think there are various h and hospitals that work very closely with their community organizations, and then there are some that are not, that don't, and they don't have that community involvement. So I think in terms of improving overall outcomes, um, it, it would be beneficial for health and hospitals to focus on improving community collaborations for all of their institutions. So I just want to say that I did listen to the report here this morning since I was here since the beginning of the meeting. 55 years ago, 1964, my mother gave birth at Harlem Hospital. 29 years ago, I gave birth under PCAP with a midwife for my son. Not very much has changed. It has just been given a different name. It has been shifted around. Somebody else now has to take the shit pot, excuse the expression, but not very much has changed. I'm out here on the front lines as a doula. I am interfacing with advocacy. I'm dealing with staff with low expectations of the patient and of their families, of the supports that they bring to the table. I'm dealing with the hub of a teaching community, which New York City hospitals are, and that is a whole nother culture that we have to talk about because I have to fight off residents who want to come in and put their hands up my client's vagina and don't identify themselves and have a problem in doing so. They don't get consent. They have low expectations, low regard, and it is the same thing that happened to me 29 years ago. So traumatic was the birth with my son. I had four miscarriages consequently. So women are dealing with the trauma. They're not talking about it, but it is still happening. Not very much has changed. And also that health and hospitals, it, it, it is the parent organization, but it is not a monolithic organization. So each, it's like, it's like a kingdom and fiefdoms, right? So then each individual hospital has its own individual culture, and then each individual right. labor and birth unit has its own individual culture. And you know, I, I really feel the disservice and the inequity is that you can go to you can go to Kings County and have a very different experience. You can go to Woodhull and have a very different experience. You can go to Bellevue and you can go to Harlem. It shouldn't be that way for it women. Not be that way. And and that is the injustice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Sounds like you have a lot of work on your plate. <laughs> um, and lastly, I just want to say to Ms. Lissane. I, on behalf of the city council, uh, I want to apologize to you. You have, you and, and other people in your network have written a beautiful letter to the council saying, where's my money? Mm -hmm. And uh, much more eloquently and graciously than that, I apologize, very graciously. And the system is betraying you. Um, you know, I, I've been trying to put you in touch with the right people who can help you move it along. I hope it, it happens soon, but it's um, really inexcusable. And that, you know, sounds, um, sounds like we're talking procurement, something not important, but in, it's its own set of cultural change that needs to happen there because they need to understand 
that we're the city is setting you up to fail when we don't that's right pay for the work that's we're right. asking you to do that's right and, and doulas doulas are working and not getting paid for eight mm -hmm. to ten months mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and i just want to say lastly you can have something on paper and it looks absolutely wonderful try living it and Evidence-based shows, because I'm also an evidence-based doula, it takes up to 10 years to change a policy. Yeah. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I just want to say, when we're, when we're discussing consent, and I just know that we structurally also, our justice system and how we prosecute Oh, very, very recently, even Dr. Robert Haddon and what he did to abuse pregnant people and the people of the city and our failure to prosecute those crimes is a disservice and a failure and it's shameful. Mm -hmm. And to everyone who's still here, I know we have one more panel to go. I just want to thank you all for your patience. The reason why um, we gave almost an hour to H&H &H today is because of the very reason that you mentioned, that there are 11 acute facilities throughout this city, and every experience is different. Yes, yes. Bellevue and Kings and Coney Island and, and Jacoby, they're all different. And, and that, to me, is something that we're, tr we're chipping away at, and that we're just not being given the tools. We need the sledgehammer and they're really having us chip away at what is a very, very serious issue. So I just want to thank you all for your years of dedication, for your service, for your commitment, for everything you said today, and keeping it very, very real. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call up this last panel, and I want to thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Becky Pine, Alestar Idelson, Catherine McFadden, Zama Neff, uh, and again, thank you, and if I mispronounce your name, please, please feel free to correct me. If there's anyone that wants to testify that did, that, that did not fill out a slip, please do so, so we can add you to the panel. You must fill out a slip to join the panel. I didn't see your slip. If you could just fill one out, just sit down and we'll get you to fill one out, no problem, no problem. Every, everyone can sit. We can take four, we can take five. I just want, I want to thank you all for your patience. I hope that some of what you heard today you'll be able to uh, help us rectify. Eugene came and left. Again, everyone can sit, exactly. We're gonna to get to everyone here. And I'm sorry if you did not fill out a slip, we just, that's how I've been going through the panel. Okay. Click. Thank you. Um, so my, I'm here from Interact. My name is Alistair Idelson. Um, I'm deeply grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you all about this crucial topic. Um, Interact is the largest and oldest organization in the country dedicated to the approximately 1.7% of the population born with variations of their sex characteristics, also called intersex. Um, intersex isn't rare. The incidence of these variations is equal approximately to the population of Japan and the world, but it's unknown largely because of decades of erasure in medical settings and especially in prenatal care. Um, the vast majority of intersex variations are medically benign, um, and with increasing advances in tech, technology, these differences are likely identified now in the prenatal setting. Um, the reason why we are here now is because we're seeing an increase in discriminatory harmful treatment that starts in prenatal care. Um, 
folks at birth serve as the first resource to parents and have the opportunity to treat intersex people respectfully as something to be celebrated rather than corrected. They have the opportunity to model good behavior instead of perpetuating years of shame and stigma that we've seen in, in the community. Um, uh, in the prenatal care setting, what does correction of an intersex child look like? It's the assumption of termination of a pregnancy regardless of the health of the fetus, as we'll hear from one of our parents in a moment. Um, after birth, these children are often subjected to irreversible and invasive, invasive surgeries like clitoral reductions and vaginoplasties without their consent. Um, these are surgeries that the state is reimbursing for, what has been, formed a deem of, a for, what has been deemed a form of torture by the United Nations. Regrettably, these responses to healthy intersex bodies are still happening in New York City today. Um, to address this, Interact is partnering with a bunch of folks on the City Council to bring proposed Bill 1748, which will mandate that the DOHMH create an informational resource campaign, which we're really hoping will pass. So Interact is proud to stand behind intersex New Yorkers as they create a world free from LGBTQI discrimination. We hope you'll stand with us. Um, my colleague is going to read a brief statement from one of our parents who wanted to be heard but could not attend today's meeting, if that's all right. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having me here to present this uh, testimony on behalf of one of our parents and uh, with permission. My name is Becky Pine and I also work with Interact. Um, so our parent says, when I was almost five months pregnant with my first child in November of 2018, thank you, um, my husband and I went for a routine ultrasound at a well-known New York City hospital. We were excited to find out everything we could about what to expect. We were fortunate Everything had been normal up until then, or as normal as being pregnant can be. During the ultrasound, when we got to the genital area, the tech looked at the scan and asked if my husband and I knew the sex. Uh, we told her that the blood test said it was a boy. She told us that couldn't be right and pointed to the screen. My husband was a little confused, but turned to me and said, oh, it's a girl, that's great. But the tech stopped and said she would have to step out for a minute and get the doctor. The tone of the room immediately shifted from excitement to fear. No one wants to hear that. The doctor came into the room and repeated the scan. He turned to my husband and I and said, this could be a very serious disorder. I was stunned, terrified, and so was my husband. As I tried to catch my breath, the ultrasound tech who was looking at my chart asked if we had done genetic testing. When I told her no, we hadn't, I could see she was disappointed, exasperated maybe. Um, the doctor told us we had to see a genetic counselor immediately and that was the start of the most terrifying two weeks of our lives. We scheduled a phone call with the genetic counselor the next day while we waited for our OBGYN, who, saw, who we saw right away after the ultrasound appointment. Um, when our OBGYN entered the room, the first words out of her mouth were, I'm so sorry. She said, I had a case like, exactly like yours three years ago, and I'm going to put you in touch with this person. You're not too late. You can terminate. And, the message, and so the message was that whatever was happening, it was so awful that the option was an abortion without even talking about it. That was the message. And you have to understand, what you have to understand is our child is perfectly healthy. She has a mild intersex variation called androgen insensitivity syndrome, which means her body does not respond to androgens. So while her chromosomes are XY, her body looks like a typical girl. Instead of saying this common intersex difference could be a, the cause and it's perfectly fine, Everyone approached the situation as if it were horrible, uh, as if we were horrible, and if she was horrible. I wish I could go back in time and tell myself that we were going to have a perfectly healthy baby, but instead we cried every night, desperately researching whether there was actually any risk for serious health problems. We went for a second and third opinion and eventually found another OBGYN who told us androgen, about androgen insensitivity. He described what it was and said, he. He said it was very normal. Um, sorry. <laughs> he was the first doctor who was more educated about intersex who didn't treat our family like there was something wrong. Our child is one and doing great now. She's awesome. I knew deep down somewhere that, um, they were telling, that what they were telling me wasn't right. And I had the maternal instinct, but it's hard when people present things as facts that aren't true, that being intersex is actually a sickness. But now we know she's not different from any other child. And that's why they should have told, what they should have told us. Education is desperately needed. I don't think our story is unique. That's why we wanted to share it with you all, um, to raise awareness and urge you to support Interact's legislation to show that these differences aren't something to be afraid of. Doctors in New York shouldn't be stuck back in time 
in a time when intersex was something to discriminate against. Our families deserve support. We learned that eventually, but it was at an enormous personal cost. When we look at our precious, beautiful baby daughter, we cannot believe what we've been through, an ordeal we will never forget, and that such negligent opinions were given from professionals we trusted. Sincerely, the mother of a healthy intersex infant in New York City, as told to Interact staff. Thank you very much. My name is Zayma Neff, and I'm with Human Rights Watch. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify before this committee today. Human Rights Watch is an independent international research and advocacy organization. We are the only international human rights organization with a dedicated program on children's rights, which I'm very proud to leave right here from our headquarters in New York City. Over the past three years, Human Rights Watch has conducted research and advocacy on the treatment of intersex youth, including medically unnecessary so-called normalizing surgeries on children born with intersex variations. We have interviewed intersex youth and adults, parents of intersex children, and physicians who care for these families across the country, including right here in New York City. In the 1960s, surgeons in the United States popularized so-called normalizing cosmetic operations on intersex infants, including reducing the size of the clitoris or increasing the size of the vagina. These surgeries are almost always medically unnecessary. They often involve giving general anesthesia at an age the FDA has deemed high risk. They are irreversible and, in some cases, sterilize the child. I myself met with a team of doctors in Manhattan who continue to promote and perform interventions to erase intersex traits, such as surgeries that reduce the size of an infant's clitoris purely for cosmetic reasons. Currently, New York City's human rights law protects intersex people from discrimination. However, there are no specific protections against these surgeries or other discriminatory interventions, and no public awareness that intersex people are at risk for operations that are high risk and medically unnecessary in the first place. This leaves parents in the dark and means that children in New York City are vulnerable to irreversible harm. As the mother of premature twins, I can empathize with the vulnerability of having just given birth, having someone come in and tell you that your babies are not okay, and feeling utterly reliant on the doctor's recommended course of action. As a New Yorker and a human rights lawyer, I expect my government to protect me and my children from harm. Since the 1990s, intersex advocates have asked governments and the medical community to prioritize their voices and defer interventions that can be delayed until patients can participate in the decisions about what will happen to their own bodies. United Nations Human Rights Committees have condemned medically unnecessary surgeries on intersex children 48 separate times. But a small subset of physicians, like the ones I met here in the city, defend the practice, and continue to thwart efforts to protect children's human rights. I am urging the city government to support Councilmember Drom's bill to develop materials to educate parents about risky and unnecessary medical interventions, and to rely on medical eth evidence, medical ethics, and patient advocates' requests to further regulate the physicians who continue to carry out operations that put intersex children at risk. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Finally, we are here at the table. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eugenia Montesinos. I am a midwife at the Metropolitan Hospital, and um, which I've been working for the past 20 years. And this is a hospital which we, uh, one of the hallmarks is that giving the prenatal care in their own language. And most of our clientele are Hispanic speaking, and my language is Spanish, and my first language. So I am here to tell you that how much is changing and what we're doing and how HAC should be approaching this. We have a model that we were working among uh, medical uh, residents and uh, we are part of the team and we having such a good outcomes um, and we being the hospital who has the lowest C-section rate in the state and only because of the collaboration that we work together with midwives. And I am also here not only because I work in a 
Metropolitan Hospital, and I'm also uh, with my colleague Sharon, we're representing New York City Midwives Association. And we are a professional association of around 400 members, all the hospitals working in the New York City area, and with the majority of us working in, in hospitals. And also we have midwives who work in a private practice, and lately are developing even more midwives working in home birth practice. And uh, why is growing? Uh, because of mothers and patients are very dissatisfied with the hospital practices, and that is another another case that is the necessity that is growing. Um, so I'm gonna try to, do you wanna say anything else? So I'm gonna continue with that. So um, the United States has the highest mortality and infant mortality rate in the world. And New York is one of the, and, and um, USA is the highest among those of us in the industrialized countries, which is very crazy. And being, having, uh, spending so much money in just poor pregnancy, poor labor, and yet we have the highest mortality rate and infants and the mothers. So um, New York is one of the biggest cities that we have that, and uh, among those is Brooklyn and the Bronx. And one of the things that HAC has a hospitals, which is Kings County, and they are not taking total advantage of the midwifery care. Mm -hmm. They are dismantling, to the contrary, they're getting smaller and smaller, and yet the maternal um, mortality is the highest in that area. The same thing happened with Lincoln in the South Bronx. It used to be a very high uh, midwifery service, and now it's non-existent. So Harlem, the same thing. They completely disappear. And uh, we are here just to let you know that the midwifery care model is a model around the world for centuries, and we've been having uh, great outcomes and all over the world, and mostly because we approach in a holistic way. We see a woman not as a person who is pregnant. We see a woman what is going on in her life, the emotional issues, the mental issues, any comorbidities that is happening, and that is the midwifery model that we follow. And we, even though we work in our hospitals, we try it our best under the circumstances, having the smallest time that we can see per person, a, a patient, we still have the good outcomes when they come to us. Lately, in, new, in Metropolitan Hospital, because of the whole um, demand of midwives in the city, we having a trans we're transforming our population in, in Metropolitan. And we're having more, um, more white people coming to us because they, have, they want a midwifery model. They want a, not, a, not a C-section, they want to have a chance to have a normal birth. So it is, for us, it's, it's just a model that everybody should have. Every mo woman should have. Every woman should have an opportunity to choice, you know, to have a choice. Either if I want to go to the medical doctor, it's fine. If we want to go to the midwife, it's good. So we want here, as a New York City midwife, we want to just give you that information that we are part and we are fighting about the maternal mortality right in the city. Aaron? Thank you. I think you said everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, to mirror what Eugenia said, um, I've been a midwife in the United States for 27 years. I, by the accent, I actually trained in the European model of care and um, my, my career has only been at h, h hospitals. I was at Harlem, I worked with Miss Lofman and then I've been at Metropolitan for the last 23 years and I've been um, service director for 14 of those. She's right. We. At Metropolitan, we we are changing our de our demographic, and it is th it is the collaborative care that we give with our medical staff. We work very closely. We have um, and we we also all of our midwives are faculty to the medical school, so we so we do impact what ha the the dynamic between with the with the residents and the medical students because yes. 
um, somebody spoke about earlier about you know not asking a patient can you examine them not talking to a patient this has got to, this is one of the things that's got to change and it is changing at our institution um, so the is everything here is a work in progress it's going to take time it's going to change it's got, we have to have a change of culture um, yes there are 11 municipal hospitals only eight of them have midwifery services and of those eight only four of them have 24 7 coverage on labor and delivery and like Eugenia said some of those services and that had had full 24 7 coverage no longer do so they've lost their midwifery services so this is something that I think needs to be worked upon, worked on that's it yeah, uh, one of the other things that we need to do for change in maternity mortality rate, uh, we are proposing to change how we should approach the care. We should approach the care where care should be where the mothers live, in the community, not in the hospital when they have to come. We have to just have a space in a community, and we, as a midwife, we can take care of them in there. So that modality need to change also. That I think that will be a better uh, ways that the woman can come, not thinking that it is a hospital. When you go in a hospital, it's a mentality that is something sick. You are going to hospital when you are sick, when you have an illness. But pregnancy is not an illness. So we should approach a little differently. And we should do offer prenatal care in the communities. And a midwifery care is being long known that we do provide in a community. So we propose that care that we should be in a community. We wanted to have providers that will reflect the community population that are culturally competent. They will understand their needs. So we want that. For example, just me alone, I will be loving working in the Bronx, which is all my Spanish speaking. I will talk to them in, in Spanish, go with them. You know, it's different. So that is what we would like to offer. We would like to provide also the care to mothers after working hours. And mostly all our mothers who are in need, they don't, they have to work. And most of them, sometimes they don't even come to the prenatal care. And we need to, we wanna offer that, we wanna change that. So we wanna, we would like to change that. If we do in a community, that we can provide it. We're not, you know, bound to going eight to five, like an office, which, <laughs> the care and the health is not an office. It is going on 24 hours a day. So that is what we would like to change. We would like to change also, uh, offer care in the weekends. Why in the weekends? Because we want to involve the family. We want to involve the sister. We want to involve the partner. They can go together. So it will be some more integrated way to how to approach maternal care. And also we want to uh, have a group visits. When we have having a group visit is much better. They can support each other. They can see that it's not just the woman alone saying, oh, this is just me. But when you have a group visit, it's much better. They can understand that they are not alone. They have into the same thing in pregnancy. So we wanna do also the, sh the care should be as, uh, decision making should be done with the women. We can just tell them, you have to do this, you have to do that. We have to talk with the woman and say, these are the things going on, these are your options, let's work in that way. So that will be the best option to approach. We can't be going and telling you gotta be doing this. It doesn't work and it's not working. And that is precisely the thing that we have in this issue. So we wanna approach birth as a healthy and holistic way. Not that you're going and it's the way that the hospital puts it the way how you have to be sitting in the monitor, go to the bed, and that is what we have to do. We don't. We want to change that model. We want to work around the woman, how she wants, how she wants to labor, how she wants. Maybe she just want to walk. Maybe she want to sit in the wall. Whatever she wants, we should be approaching how she wants to do, not how we want it. So another thing that we wanted to do is also postpartum care. We have so much issues about postpartum care. And our maternal death is also happening after having the babies. So I don't, uh, we wanna have the community-based postpartum care. We have to go to the mother. 
We, why are we expecting a mother who just had a baby to, to come into us? We have to go to, the, to their place, and it should be shorter. Right in two weeks, we're going to see how is she doing. Uh, is breastfeeding established or not? Is she alone or not? Does she have any community support or not? Does having a family member that supports or not? We have no idea what's going on with a woman who just had a baby. We just start we saying, okay, now you are on your own with your baby. But that is what a problem that we're having. So postpartum care should be at two weeks, then six weeks, and then we can see how we can go. But we should go to the mother. We should go how we have it is the mother doesn't have a time. We should be going. Why are we expecting them to come? So another thing that we wanted to do, uh, everything should be evidence-based approach. The study said we have so much research done how we approach maternal care. One of the other things that we have been now since um, maternal uh, care and maternal birth and, and uh, births at home is happening, one of the things that we want is that H and H should be um, an easy transition when the birth didn't happen at home, and it should not be punishable. We should not be looking at them and saying, "Well, you're choosing this now. This is that." It should be an easy transition. We should work with the home birth midwives. We should tell them when is the time. We should actually put a document saying, "This is when this is not happening. We want you to come and bring us." not bring us when it's too late, when we get very upset. Everybody gets upset, but we should be looking for that. We should be helping the, the woman, helping the midwife, and help everyone. So that is one of the things that we, we want to offer as a solution for a better maternal care in New York City. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Council, Council Member Rivera, Council Member Rosenthal, thank you so much for hearing our testimony. My name is Katie McFadden. I'm a midwife, a registered nurse certified in neonatal intensive care, and a volunteer and organizer with Ancient Song Doula Services. Um, I just want to highlight uh, the things that we haven't talked about yet. Um, we've talked a lot about racial disparities in maternal infant health outcomes and the root causes to that. Um, but uh, you know, we've talked about implicit bias and lots of other things, but the driving force of racial disparities in New York City is the lower quality of care provided at a concentrated set of minority serving hospitals. So we have a 2016 study that showed that if black women were going to the same hospitals that white women were going to, the severe maternal morbidity rate would drop by 47.7%. That's half. Um, and we have the same researcher put out a different study in 2018, again, looking just at New York City hospitals. So this is, you know, germane to us specifically and really no other place in the nation, um, that if black babies were being taken care of in the same neonatal intensive care units as white babies were, the differences in uh, morbidity rates for very low birth weight babies would drop by 40%. Um, so in the research, those hospitals are anonymized, but if you are familiar with the, the landscape of New York City, it's really Kings County, Brookdale, and SUNY Downstate. Half of, black, half of black women in Brooklyn give birth in one of these three hospitals that have a severe maternal morbidity rate six to nine times higher than Maimonides, which is less than 10 miles away. Um, so the, um, the driving for, like, so why is care at those three hospitals so much worse than all of these other hospitals? And uh, I think um, along with his, like, historical racism, which excuses some of the behavior in the minds of people with power who work in those institutions, a lot of it is um, the, the resource deprivation to the public serving hospitals. Um, because Medicaid, you know, we've, Medicaid pays about half as much for obstetric services that private insurance pays. So if you have a hospital that serves a disproportionate amount of people on Medicaid, you're going to have half as much money coming in and that, that literally does not cover the band-aids, the salaries, the keep the lights on to provide adequate standard care in the year 2019. 
So that the fact that Medicaid reimbursements are unequal is tacitly admitted to within the legislation because there's a separate pool of money called the disproportionate share hospital pool. And in most other states, that, movie, that money is used as it is intended and goes to the hospitals that serve a disproportionate share of hospitals. However, in New York, there is a law from Albany that divides that money into two pools, one for the private hospitals to divide into and one for the public hospitals to divide into. So for example, in 2016, uh, NYU served 18 times fewer uh, patients on Medicaid than Elmhurst did, but got five million dollars more from Albany to compensate them from that for that care. Um, so those the the fact that the money isn't actually ending up in the institutions where it's needed has caused decades of hiring freezes and layoffs, so that there is almost never the recommended amount of staff. Uh, working at any period in time. Um, in 2000, uh, I graduated from midwifery school in 2017, having just recently learned about these disparities, and I did not want to take a position as a midwife working in a system where I would be perpetuating medical, perpetuating medical racism without understanding how or why. Um, and so I stayed in my position as a NICU nurse at SUNY Downstate. I sent, um, and this, I sent an email on August 8th saying we are incredibly understaffed. What are we doing to get more staff here? August 9th, Duchesco Florman died, a mother of six, from understaffing related causes. In the next four months, I sent emails up to the entire chain of command, including the president of the hospital, saying we are just as understaffed today as when a mother died. What are we doing to get more staff? And the only thing that happened to that was the administration beginning to take retaliatory actions against me for speaking up about safety issues. We never got more nurses. What I did not realize at the time was that like literally the same days I was sending emails, the headlines in the news was that Cuomo was holding on to disproportionate share hospital payment that was owed to our hospital that we had already paid, that he was going to hold on to because he wanted us to get used to what it would be like uh, for future budget cuts. The h, &H hospital sued and ended up getting that money, but SUNY Downstate isn't an h, &H hospital, and it just dropped out of the news and in November, Tunisia Walker, another black woman, died of understaffing related causes at SUNY Downstate. Um, so I think it is incredibly important that we, like, like, there is no health equity without equity in health financing. If you give some hospitals twice as much money as other hospitals, they're going to provide better care. And when you overlay that with the, with the, with, um, the state violence of segregation and discriminatory housing practices, this, this, this phenomenon, these three hospitals are, are probably responsible for about half of the disparity that we're seeing. Um, so ju just a couple more notes. People today have um, talked about how the H&H &H hospitals serve underserved people. And I just wanna challenge that language and that understanding. If, if people are underserved by public hospitals, it is us, the public, who is underserving them. Um, and so I want to, you know, often at Downstate, people would uh, would justify the sub suboptimal -sub care we were providing by saying, well, they wouldn't get better care elsewhere. That was the exact same logic used during the Tuskegee syphilis study. That, oh, well, these people participating in the study wouldn't get better care elsewhere, so it's okay that we're doing what we're doing. Um, and the, that mentality that it's okay to provide worse medical care to people who are underserved, well, no, they wouldn't be underserved if you were providing them adequate medical care. Um, uh, just a, um, Council Member Rosenthal, you had asked, you know, if some of the misbehavior on the OB's part was a, was a training issue or a resource issue, and I would offer that it's all, all of those issues. Um, it's hard to be polite to patients when you have two or three times the safe amount that you're caring for. Um, you're the decision-making process of how, to, if you're caring, how you keep three laboring patients safe is very different from how you could keep one laboring patient safe. And it would, it may, it often cuts into the time you have to discuss options and to really get and obtain full consent. Um, 
And then, but just to bring this full circle, more doctors are trained at SUNY, more doctors who practice in New York City are trained at SUNY Downstate than any other medical school. So if we, if we send our med students to a 90% black hospital, where it's, okay to, where it's okay that women just are dying left and right in childbirth and we don't get the money or the help we need to provide adequate care. And that's the, the mindset you are trained with as, as a doctor. And then we send you out into the rest of the city, even if you're now working with a more privileged population. It doesn't necessarily mean you can change on a dime going from seeing birthing people as subhumans who you can boss around to being fully human that you are interacting with in a collaborative way. Um, so the, the racism, the structural racism we have allowed to to continue at SUNY Downstate is making healthcare worse for everybody in New York City. Um, so I guess for, um, and then lastly, we've been talking a lot about midwives, but the three New York City midwifery programs are at NYU, SUNY Downstate, and Columbia, all three of which are institutions which exclude midwives from practicing in, their, in the hospital themselves. So there's this huge disconnect in the way that the, the organizations who are tasked with training midwives, like, do they, do they actually respect us? Do they actually see us as uh, valuable members of a healthcare team if they will take our money to, to give us a degree but won't employ us or hire us afterwards? Um, the, my, so some recommendations going forward. I think it's a lot easier, you know, we've talked about a lot about what to do about racist providers. I think it is a lot easier to uh, train a black woman to be a midwife than it is to get a white woman to stop being racist. Um, so I think uh, what's something to consider would be creating um, a midwifery program at a an HBCU or perhaps creating like a like a futuristically black college or university that has a midwifery program. Uh, see how much uh, Dr. Uh, how much Helena Grant and Patricia Lachman, who testified earlier today, how much would they want to start a, a midwifery program um, where we could, you know, if there was perhaps a program with a SUNY, uh, with the CUNY College attached to Woodhall, we could be producing 10 amazing black midwives a year that would over time transform or could tra potentially transform the midwifery scene in New York City. Um, we need to pass the pass New York Health Act because as long as we have private and public insurance, we are going to have a mechan like the that is the mechanism that the private hospitals are using to to cause de facto racial racial segregation is by practicing uh, insurance segregation. Uh, insurance discrimination is illegal. It violates two federal, two state, and one local law. But when the New York Lawyers for Public Interest tried to challenge the practice several years ago, uh, Cuomo, who was the Attorney General at the time, refused to take it up. So if we have these laws, but if we're not going to enforce them, I think the, the other way forward is to just get rid of that mechanism by which we're sorting people. Um, and then lastly, uh, home birth needs, we need to have like uh, a public option for home birth. So the midwives who were, like, we should have home birth midwifery services that are as accessible and perhaps based out of the public hospitals, but that will come and do a home birth because it shouldn't just be privileged white women um, who can pay $10,000 out of pocket who uh, have the option to keep themselves out of these violent places that we've allowed to exist in New York. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your recommendations. And I think you'll find a lot of us are, are aligned. It's, and I want to, we've been joined by Council Member Reynoso. You could definitely ask a question. I, and and uh, you missed the, the Woodhall, the whole thing. So he'll tell you a story very quickly. Uh, Council Member Reynoso. Uh, I just want to thank, uh, this is, thank you for this hearing. As usual, the Health and Hospitals um, Committee is really in the front line of taking on issues that, um, have been foreign to this uh, council in the past or that we've not addressed in an intentional way. Um, I had my child in Woodhall Hospital um, with a midwife, um, or my wife had a child in Woodhall <laughs> Hospital, <laughs> and a midwife assisted us. <laughs> yes. I gotta be very careful. The midwives in, a, in a Woodhall Hospital have high standards as to how I speak about delivery, um, so I wanna make sure I stay consistent with that. Um, I wanted to just ask, um, it, just a numbers question, uh, because these, uh, Woodhall is also a public hospital, and its rate is significantly lower 
than these other three public hospitals in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And the midwifery program, the midwifery program is one of those, I believe is one of those reasons. Um, but do we have statistics related to like C-sections and just invasive uh, uh, procedures uh, pr uh, produced in, in one hospital that has a similar demographic like Kings County to Woodhull Hospital? And uh, a midwife told me that uh, a surgeon's job is to, be, is to do surgery. Um, if they are the ones that are in a room and they have to make a decision, they're going to attempt to uh, use their talent or their, 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 their profession to solve the problem. If they're not in the room, then surgery becomes something that's less likely to happen. If it's a midwife, they're not gonna go in and cut someone open and so forth. So I just wanna know, do we have information as to um, uh, you know, C-sections and other procedures during birth in Kings County Hospital different from Woodhall Hospital given, again, same demographic when it comes to the population of people they're serving both income, with income and race base. So uh, yes, we do have those numbers and when you look at the, uh, when you look at Central Brooklyn, the role of midwives comes through clear as day because you have Woodhall, which um, uh, you have Woodhall with a C-section rate in like the mid 20s, low 30s. You have Brookdale and Kings County with cesarean section rates in the mid 30, 30%. And SUNY Downstate has had a cesarean section rate somewhere between 45 and 50% over the past, the past 10 years. So what are the differences between between those three, four hospitals. The first three all have midwifery services and SUNY Downstate does not. So you take away the midwives and you get a 15% jump in the cesarean section rate with, mm -hmm. with, like, with zero distinguishing factors between our patient population. We serve, you know, Kings County and Downstate. I can see the one hospital from the other uh, yeah. or across yeah. the street. Um, and then when you zoom, we've talked a lot about today about like, uh, the midwifery model of care, or just because you have midwives, doesn't mean that the patients are receiving midwifery care. And so when you look at the three hospitals that have midwives, the reason why Woodhall is doing so much better is because Helena Grant is in charge and they let her run the show. Yeah. And whereas at Kings County and Brookdale, the midwife is essentially treated like uh, the director of midwifery is essentially treated like a glorified nurse manager, yeah. and they are essentially subservient to the obstetric staff. Their decisions are overrid at any point in time by the obstetric staff with no consultation, with no conversation. I did my midwifery training at Brookdale, and I was working with a midwife with 40 years experience, and a 30-year-old OBGYN came in and told, like, as we were talking with the patient, said, we're going to go for a C-section now, and we were like, uh, we're, we're doing what? So it wasn't even, she didn't even, the OB did not even like skipped having the conversation with the patient. She even skipped having the conversation Midwife. with the care providers. Mm -hmm. So just like, so I think it is an amazing testament to the power of midwives that even when we are deprived of structural power, there is still a 15% difference than a yeah. place where we are not. No, but true. if we really want to see the full benefit of midwifery care, we need to uh, we need to essentially reprimand and hold the obstetric, the obstetric teams at those hospitals accountable for the way they are using their male privilege to subjugate perfectly qualified women from yep. leading in their, in their, to the full capacity right. levels. And, and I agree by having uh, Miss Helena Grant um, in the hospital makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone can tell her what to do, even if uh, <laughs> she didn't have the title. Uh, but again, I really want to thank you for this information that we're getting and for attention to, to detail. And I think that conversation about, it's not just about having midwives, it's about empowering them, is very important because I think that a lot of folks are just looking for a place to go where there are midwives, not understanding the dynamics of what it means to, to have an empowered group versus just a group that's um, mm -hmm. seen as like a second, a second hand um, assistant, I guess. Um, where in, in Woodhull, the midwives run the whole show. Um, so thank you so much for, for that information. And I'm really looking forward to making this a very important part of the work that I do over the next two years. So I'm very happy that we had this, this hearing. And I apologize that I couldn't be here for the beginning, but um, I'm looking forward to meeting with H&H &H to talk about how we can improve I want Woodhull Hospital to be the premier um, baby hospital in all of New York, uh, private or public uh, alike, and we're gonna be investing in that. And the midwife, the reason it, it's a, it got a solid foundation for that to happen is because of its midwife program. So thank you again for the great work that you thank, guys are doing. Thank you, council member. And I just wanna say when we're, we're talking about, you know, male privilege, it's also, we have to recognize our own privileges 
uh, each and every one of us. So I just want to make sure that we just recognize that space. Sh Sharon, can I ask you a question? Because you were at Harlem Hospital before yes. you went to Metropolitan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they closed that program. Mm -hmm. And and based on your very, I guess, I don't want humble experience. I mean, you have decades doing mm -hmm. this. Did you find that there, it was necessary to close the Harlem program? No, not at all. It, like you allude, which you actually said, I won't even say you alluded to, it, is, it has a midwifery service is, though we want, you want, uh, Helena is a very, very strong woman, but you still have to have a service director, a chair of OBGYN that is, for want of a better phrase, midwifery friendly. Because if you have a midwifery-friendly department chair, then your, then your life is easier. And what happened at Harlem was it, the power structure changed. When I was there, it was to deliver a different chair of the department who was midwifery-friendly. The midwives had been there for decades. It was fine. I left, I left and went to Met, and then it all changed. And, and as midwives left, they were not replaced. Same thing happened at Lincoln. Lincoln had, was one of the biggest midwifery services in the city, public or private. It had something like 18 to 20 midwives worked that hospital. There are now maybe one. You know, as they shut down, but that was two things. That was twofold. That was a director of midwifery plus a director of chair of OB, OB. It didn't work. They just got rid of all the midwives. As they, they left, they did not replace them. Another thing you have to bring in as well into the whole structure is whether the hospital we, ha, it has a residency program. Mm -hmm. We do have a residency program. We're pretty unique in the way we work that we are still 24 seven on labor and delivery. We have, it's a, it's a demand from, our, from the, the women as well. We've always, had, we've always been 24, actually no we are, that's I tell a lie. <laughs> when I first started there, no we weren't 24 seven, we became, because as our, our service got bigger, we, we provide 24 seven service, and it's a demand. We could not change that now, it would, it would decrease the amount of women that are coming to, this, coming to the hospital. But Harlem, yes, Harlem is, it, what happened at Harlem is very sad, because I did, I did love working there, it was very busy. Everything that was, but it, yes, it was a change in management. It was a change at the top, changed everything. Well, can I add one more thing? Uh, one of the things that, um, why we saying it is good in Metropolitan, working with medical uh, residents is they're exposed to us. They're exposed to our, um, our work and that we work together. We train them when they have to do a normal deliveries, a normal care so they being exposed. So if a doctor is not exposed to the midwifery care model, it's never gonna know. And that is one of the things that it happens. If this doctor was not exposed, he was not gonna know how midwives work. And that is one of the things that happened also in Lincoln. Another thing that is happen it happens in New York uh, is that the reimbursement issue. New York Presbyterian had the largest midwifery, and now have none. What happened is that they were billing in the doctor's name and not in the midwife's name because you get more money. If you get reimbursed for our job, we only get 85%. And because of that, they billed in, in the doctor's name, and because of that, they saw it was a fraud. So what, they, what happened with that? New York Presbyterian said, okay, we don't need midwives. We're gonna charge, we wanna get the 100%. So we don't, we're not gonna use you. So that is one of the things, but at the same time, their C-section rate and everything has changed. But it doesn't change because they're gonna get the money anyway. So, but what happens? What is the consequences of the women? Women have more C-sections, the morbidity increases, the mortality increases. That is the main issue here. It's just because you get the 100% reimbursement, at what cost? At the women's cost, at the baby's cost, the premurity, at the prematurity cost. We pay 26 billion annually in the United States for prematurity alone, and we prevent that. We did studies, we have so many studies we can prevent that. 
So that is the, the reason why it's changing and why it changed in HAC model that they got rid of those midwives. Thank you. And thank you so much um, to this panel. Our midwives, doulas, doctors, nurses, advocates. I, I know we're all supporting each other. The intersex community, I, I am supporting the legislation. Um, you all have taught me a tremendous amount in these uh, first two years in the council, and I hope that we can continue to, I hope we can change the formula on how we distribute our dollars in our healthcare system. Because it's clearly change. not working. We need so to it's, I a, it's a national issue. It's not just a state issue. It's not just a city issue. It's a national issue. And we just need to change. Thank we you. Change. And, I, and I will be there with you all. I mean, here in, in Albany, there's a lot of work to do. And I want to thank you for your time and your patience. I know we're in hour four of the hearing. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who waited. And um, I, I'm very, very appreciative. And if there are... No longer well, any. we thank you for calling for this uh, hearing, and thank you for being an ally to all of you, and thank you for understanding what the crisis that we are, and as a woman, and I think uh, we should work and fight together. Thank you. I'm mean, the largest healthcare system in the country, and we should be leaders on this issue. Thank you, everyone, and with that, I'm going to close this hearing. Thank you.